in Fiji. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in everything you do. And He will give you success.
My name is Richard Hartnett and I work as the ECHOES International Equipping and Training Manager. I'd just like to tell you about Tilsley College, a ministry of GLOW Europe. The college has been involved in training people for Christian ministry for a number of years and my wife and I both studied there before serving in Peru. The one year certificate program combines classroom learning with practical experience in various areas, including cross-cultural ministry. It's a great way to deepen your understanding develop your skills and see what God might be calling you to. Echoes International has partnered with Glow and Tilsley College to support several students each year. So if you have an interest in cross-cultural mission, the support of your local church, and feel that a year at Tilsley would help you to explore this, then we'd be keen to talk with you about that. Also, if you are a church leader and feel that one of your members would benefit from the Tilsley Certificate Year as preparation for cross-cultural ministry, whether in the UK or overseas, then please contact us. The time that my wife and I spent at Tilsley certainly gave us a good foundation for the subsequent years we spent in Peru. And if you feel this experience would be a good next step for you or for someone that you know in your church, then please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Auziți sirenile de culcare. De Friends, greetings from Kiev. Today is 17th of May and we are packing our minibuses to take a long trip to East Ukraine, Donetsk, Lugansk provinces, Slavyansk city, Kramatorsk. Here our friends, volunteers, pastors, which will travel together far away from Kiev. Three days, three. Thank you, all of you, to all of you who has been helping us to have all this really important provision, which we will bring with us to front line. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your love, your help, your support. Greetings from all of us. God bless you. Dear Petr Hus, here is Fyodor, you know maybe him, but you don't know me, you know, our brothers, volunteers, pastors, and we reach destination. This is all help from you, from your brothers and sisters in Czech Republic and Czech Republic and Slovakia. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. So we are in Slavyansk in East Ukraine and delivering all provision here brothers and sisters in the several buses four buses came here so thank you friends for your love your prayer and your care about us god bless you friends Friends, we are on the way to Liman city. Russians just a few days ago left it 
those towns, cities where we now, and you see exploded all bridges. So we try with our chaplains and the military uh, escort to come through. Here's our buses. So many killed people. Destructions is horrible. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just put. Well. Yes. Come. And we, because we will bring necessary help to to Liman. Nobody uh, of other organizations are have possibility opportunity to come there. Mm -hmm. Then we have third car. So, da, 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 good, good. This is where we are. Так, это на дети Нет, это их. Тоже вам? Это все вам. Да, и сейчас, смотрите, смотрите, это не вина. just been encouraged by uh, just the teaching that we receive on faith and um, just encouraged that it's uh, step by step that we can live a life of faith and uh, I, seem, I think that's been a really encouraging thing that we've learned this weekend. Well I've really enjoyed being at Wider Horizons. Faskily House is beautiful. It's been great to be with a good group of young people who all have an interest in mission. It's been a fun informal time um, and I've really enjoyed the praise times and I've especially enjoyed having those opportunities for one-on-one -on -one, um, with young people talking about their lives, where they're at and possible next steps for them. So I've enjoyed learning about um, the different work that missionaries do abroad and how they bring their own individual skills to the table and um, how they serve Jesus now. I've enjoyed getting to meet lots of new Christians from different backgrounds and some from different cultures and learning more about their faith. Yeah, I've really enjoyed from this weekend just being able to ask a lot of questions of people who have so much experience in the field of mission and really being inspired by that and encouraged.
definitely wasn't expecting to learn as much as I did at Tilsey and it was, it was amazing. I was pushed beyond my comfort zone and the Lord was really faithful to be walking closely with me at this time. Thank you to First Serve for being able to give me this opportunity to be able to sort of strengthen my faith and being able to equip myself so I can hopefully spread the gospel even further in the future. just been encouraged by uh, just the teaching that we receive on faith and um, just encouraged that it's uh, step by step that we can live a life of faith and uh, I, seem, I think that's been a really encouraging thing that we've learned this weekend. Well I've really enjoyed being at Wider Horizons. Baskerly House is beautiful. It's been great to be with a good group of young people who all have an interest in mission. It's been a fun informal time um, and I've really enjoyed the praise times and I've especially enjoyed having those opportunities for one-on-one -on -one, um, with young people talking about their lives, where they're at and possible next steps for them. So I've enjoyed learning about um, the different work that missionaries do abroad and how they bring their own individual skills to the table and um, how they serve Jesus in that way. 
I've enjoyed getting to meet lots of new Christians from different backgrounds and some from different cultures and learning more about their faith. Yeah, I've really enjoyed from this weekend just being able to ask a lot of questions of people who have so much experience in the field and mission and really being inspired by that and encouraged. with the title Footsteps Worth Following. Just some housekeeping notices as we start. Please note the fire exits at the rear and at each side um, of the front of the hall here. Um, if you need to, um, the toilets and you haven't found where they are, if you go out the back, then to your left, uh, you'll see the signs to the toilets along there. And if we can all remember to switch our mobile phones off, um, that would be great. I just want to start by reading a scripture from John chapter 21, the end of verse 19. Um, then he, the Lord Jesus, said to him, that is, Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. As the NRV says, you must follow me. I'm going to invite David Brown, who is a trustee of Echoes International, to come up and uh, open in prayer. Father, we think of this command that applies to every one of us. Follow me. Your precious word teaches us that others have labored. Others have done all the hard work. And you have entered into their labors. We thank you for this conference today. We thank you for everyone who has come along we pray for help for those who will participate. We pray that you will lead them and guide them and help them to remember the things that you would have them to share with us today. We pray for ourselves who listen, that through your servants we will hear your voice speaking to us, encouraging us, challenging us, and causing us to bow in thanksgiving. We think of that beautiful Verse found in the book of Psalms, the Lord has done great things, and we are glad. And so, Father, we ask for a sense of your presence. We ask for your help and for your blessing. And we just pray that you will be with us today. We ask all these, our requests, and we return to you our morning praise and worship in and through the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, David. Uh, we're going to start our time together by singing To God Be the Glory. So I'll invite all those who are able to to stand and let's sing this together. Thank you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
Sit down. We do want to welcome those who are still arriving. We've got some seats available on the front row um, and a few, just one or two scattered around, and we're putting out some more chairs as well. So it's good to see everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome David McAdam to come and share a report from Chitokoloki. It's much easier just to say chit, um, and I'm sure that's what most of you do. Um, so, um, welcome, David, to come and uh, share your report. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. And it's uh, very nice to... Uh, be with you. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, hear a bit more about the work at Chit, General Chitoka Loki. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, most of us just call it Chit. I'm sorry if some of you have already seen some of the, the slides. I have only 25 minutes, so I, I just can't fit anything into 25 minutes, so. Uh, anybody who's been listening to me know that I can't even fit anything into an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have to be right today on time. So I'll try and cut the things as, uh, as, as quickly as I can. So let's see where we are. Chitoka Loki, Zambia. Uh, Moulahan Di Mwani. Uh, if there's any Lunder speakers, don't pay any attention to that, but it means, uh, are you alive? And I've been saying it's a great word for a doctor. It's a Lunder greeting, are you alive? So, Muna Handi Mwani, and I trust at 11 o'clock, you can all say Ayo Mwani, or whatever it is, <laughs> that you're very much alive. Uh, the Lunda language is a very interesting one, and uh, our sister Vera, Vera Hook, who just passed away a, a few days ago, uh, they were telling me that she was singing um, uh, a Lunda chorus a few days before she went to be with, uh, with the Lord Jesus. So a lot of, quite a number of people do know it. That, that's the Victoria Falls. And uh, let's just uh, uh, look at these verses. Uh, turn to the book of James, uh, chapter 4. James, chapter 4, if you have the Bible with you there, and 14 says, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, 
For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And uh, I like James because James is a very practical book. And James gets right to the a kernel of the matter. He says, doesn't waste any time. What is your life? And the answer is, it's short. You can get many answers to that question from various people, but your life is short. It's like a vapor. We live in the banks of the Zambezi River, and in the morning you can see the mist over the river, and you go back at lunchtime and it's gone and gone. And that's like our life. God says it's short. You might not think that, but looking back now, uh, our life just seems to go like, has gone like a flash, and we've been quite a number of years our, our sister Betty's been out in Zambia for 46 years, and yet it just has gone very, very, very quickly. So, young person today in our meeting, uh, what about your life? Remember, it's short. And what are you doing with your life, is the question. And you see, I'll not turn to this, just, we'll just read it there. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Ye are bought with a price. What did our hymn say? Each of us, we are the purchase of blood, the blood of God's own son. God had only one son, and he gave him for you and for me. And uh, what are you doing with your life? Are you glorifying God with that life of yours? Or are you just living for yourself? Look at the lovely sky here, the Chitokoloki, and uh, it's the heavens declare the glory of God. We know that. But the heavens are, it was, they, it didn't cost God too much to put them there. His mouth, he just, the breath of his mouth, and, but they just sit there. It's a different thing with you and me, because you and I have to make a conscious decision to glorify God, to use our lives for something in his service. And that would be my cha little challenge to you this morning. Are you glorifying God with your life? And you know what it says in scripture, that they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. The Bible tells us that we are the light of the world. And you know, there's so much darkness today. Uh, it's so important that there's light shining in that darkness. And you and I are the lights of this world. So let's live up to our responsibilities. <clears throat> that's Zambia, and that's uh, where I'll be talking about. Tidogaluki, uh, Savuma, Deepalada. I'm just going to confine myself to those three areas for the sake of time, quite close to Angola. And I think that's all I'd say. It's a Central African country. That's the president, uh, Hakaindi Hichilema. And could I ask you to pray for our president? He is, um, as far as we can tell, he's a believer and he's doing his best to keep the country on a righteous course. Um, pray for, he's known by everyone as HH, HH, so that's easy to remember. Um, her brother Harry Hunter was saying to me one day there that it's easy for him to remember his, his initials. Population is 18 million, official language is English, and 70 local languages, Lunda and Luvali, are the two in our area. And uh, if you're going to really get to know the people, you have to know some of their language. I'm not a great linguist, but I do my best to speak the language. And they must have heard I'm coming back soon because they put me down to speak on Christmas Day. And that, that will be in Lunda. <laughs> That's the only booking I have. <laughs> um, Central Africa was a former British colony. And so language, English, it's had independence since 1964. Peaceful. I'm very thankful for that and a nice place to come. You're all very welcome if you ever make it out. Most of the assembly work has been concentrated in the Northwest province or up in the Northern province, but there are assemblies scattered throughout the area. Uh, that's us, believe it or not. And uh, the, the thing is, uh, life is short. And uh, you know, th this year I celebrated my, I became a pensioner and uh, we were 31 years in Africa, and it just seems to have gone like that, just, just like a flash. You can talk to Betty, she's, she's not mind me telling you her birthday yesterday, so 80, 84, and pretty fast, just, just like that. And yet, what a joy to have served God for 
those years in, in Africa. We should serve God everywhere. You don't have to serve him in Africa, but wherever you are, let's be, all be serving our Lord Jesus because he's such a wonderful savior. Um, I've had the, I decided or asked God early in life when, well, I was in my teenage years, what did he want me to do? I wanted to be an engineer, but to my surprise, the answer came back, I was to be a medical missionary. And uh, so I did mention with that in mind, and uh, I think bring, going back to that uh, a verse we read, you know, glorify God in your body. God has a use for our bodies, you know. He, he, no matter what part of him it is, he, he can use our bodies in his service. And uh, I have had the great joy now for over uh, 30 years of serving people in their deepest need, um, providing medical care uh, for those at really life's, life's extremes. And we do it at no cost, or almost no cost. You might talk about 5p or 10p. And that's one of the good things about the assembly medical work, what we're talking about today. It is at no cost, it's free. We try to make it like salvation. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of medical care is, is artificially priced. You know, I once said to Brother Ray Williams, who was a doctor in Congo, I said, Ray, I've got a great book for you. I says, it says how to treat medical, or how to treat surgical patients for less than a dollar a day. And Ray was horrified. He says, David, how could anybody ever spend a dollar a day on a surgical patient? And you can do tremendous operations at very low cost. Um, you will get maybe better care in some places. Uh, but it will be very, if you go to the cities in, in Zambia, you get very good care. But for most of our people, they would have to be millionaires to do that. They just cannot afford uh, that level of treatment. So when I look at that picture, it reminds me of one thing is that uh, God, two things. God is faithful. He cares for us uh, over those years. And God's people are faithful. And I must not forget to thank you all for your goodness to us over so many years. It has been a tremendous privilege to serve the Lord out in Africa. Uh, that's Chit, if you're looking for the air, and uh, that's the runway. Uh, where am I, air? Uh -huh. And that's the hospital building. It's just a small bit, and there's uh, uh, the, the bottom building is the aircraft hangar. Small hospital, 100 beds, but uh, very, very busy. Uh, associated with an assembly. So many of our mission hospitals are associated, they're all associated with an assembly because, uh, first of all, our brethren planted the assembly and then the medical needs were so great, the next thing was a clinic and then a clinic would develop into a, a hospital. We have about 12 big mission hospitals in Central Africa and almost no mission doctors. I think I'm correct in saying that amongst the 12, I would be the only missionary doctor uh, there. And so that, that's something to pray for, that God might touch the hearts of young people who are medically qualified, doctors and nurses, the tremendous need in, in these places. Um, I can't go into all the details of the assembly work, I would like to, but the assembly is much like here. And uh, you got some very interesting people in it. And this is Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth was a an old brother with, uh, he had leprosy. And Kenneth's feet were twisted, he, he couldn't walk. He, his hands were twisted, he couldn't move them. And the leprosy had destroyed his eyes. And in the morning, Sunday morning, when it came for the breaking of bread, Chris Brundage would bring him down and carry him into the meeting. And he would sit there and they would, somebody would put the bread to his lips and the, and the cup. And you would think that never was a man in more pitiful condition. And yet when you heard that man thank God, to thank God for his son and for salvation and for the blessings that God had given them. And without a trace of, you know, it just came right from his heart. And it made me ashamed any time I felt uh, inclined to uh, complain. And I thought it might maybe cheer up somebody up today. There are many people in our, life, in our world who are much, much worse than us. I hear about the cost of living crisis Every one of the people in our area would just love to have a cost of living crisis. They just, they, nobody has very, they have very, very little money. And uh, anyway, Kenneth got COVID. 
and he was in the hospital for a few days, and then he, um, he seemed to get better. We sent him home to his little house here, and he, uh, sadly, after a couple of days, he, he went to be with the Lord. But what a transformation to go from that state into the presence of the Lord of glory. And it's uh, wonderful what salvation does in, in human lives. Some assemblies are small like this, that's rift, mud bricks. That's the, this is what we call the conference center. And you can see the, uh, this whole area here. It used to be all leprosy, but leprosy has been replaced by HIV. We have about 240 patients now in HIV treatment. The Northern Ireland has just over 1,100 patients in total. So, and we are a small hospital, so you can imagine how much HIV there is in Zambia. It's about 10% of the population. But this was leprosy, and Gordon and myself and others, we decided to convert these houses into um, places for Christians coming in from a distance. So some Christians come from a long distance away, um, say for a conference. Nobody has a car, so they need somewhere to stay if they're there for two or three days. And all these houses have been converted, and uh, uh, it's a very nice place now. In fact, there's a camp for uh, girls going on there at the moment, uh, Dorothy would say, for senior girls. This is Gordon, uh, the photo Gordon and Ruth. The photograph is a bit uh, old, so he's not just as uh, young looking maybe, as a, but he's hard to get a photograph of Gordon. But him and Ruth, um, Gordon's the administrator, and really he's been the one largely responsible for the development of so much of Chitoka Loki. It's as if the hospital uh, and the mission there are his baby almost, you know. So if you crack a tile, say, in the operating theater, you tell Gordon and it's repaired magically just, uh, you know, within 24 hours or so. So he's a great love for that. And uh, his wife, Ruth, works at the, um, uh, with the woman as well. Uh, so uh, remember Gordon and Ruth Hanna. Gordon's father was Richard Hanna, commended from the Lurgan Assembly to Chile many years ago. His brother still uh, works in, uh, in Chile. I think his brother's Dennis. Uh, and the, we built, that's the center, little building in that conference center. Uh, Dorothy, 20, Dorothy's 75, and she's out, at, uh, on the, out on the countryside many days doing, um, uh, either doing medical work or t teaching women from the, how to read the scriptures and so on. So pray for Dorothy. She's not as fit as she used to be. She took this girls' camp about two, uh, three months ago, and uh, she um, saw two girls saved at that. And now she's having another meeting at the moment uh, with, I think, uh, smaller girls probably. Uh, this is Hannah. Uh, Hannah Wallace with her Sunday school class. The Sunday school is at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we thank God for, for that work as well. Her and Alison do uh, uh, that Sunday school work. That's Shavuma. Shavuma's just had their 100th anniversary, and what I'm trying to give you an idea of is the amount of work that's going on just in that small triangle. And, you know, it's very, very small. Shavuma, uh, 100th anniversary, mission was started in 1922, and they had these meetings just in August. Um, our 100th anniversary was from uh, 2014. So um, we thank God for these things. Uh, I'll just speak about the two Japanese girls there, uh, Tamako and Ayumi, are the two nurses. Tamako sailed through our brother Jim Curry out in Japan, and Ayumi sailed there as well. And God calls them to work in Zambia. Uh, and they've been both running the hospital, very often without a doctor, uh, over the last 10 years or so, a long time. So do pray for Tamako and Ayumi. That's Martha in the middle there. Uh, she teaches in the school. Um, hospital work is, needs a lot of structure. It's not something you can walk into a hut and start. Maybe you could, but it wouldn't be very efficient. So we've got solar panels now. We have um, the borehole water. And it's very, very nice setup at Chitoka Loki. We were green a long time before anybody here. We had those solar panels. And now, you can only run a hospital, as you say, because of the backup. And uh, this is from our brother Kenneth Craig up there. 
Uh, they send containers out to us several times a year, and there's one going out, I think it's the 26th, he told me. Just a hint if anybody's free to do some packing of these things. It's uh, coming up soon anyway. And it's unbelievable what that difference that makes. Uh, and that's what makes our hospitals different from any other hospital, is the backup we have from outside. And we get gauze, we get all sorts of surgical instruments, equipment, etc., etc. As patients come to us from all over, sometimes we get visitors. Uh, this is brother Thomas Wallace and his wife uh, June and uh, uh, Hannah there again, and Dr. Ross Jefferson. We're thankful for visitors. They make it cheer us up immensely. Um, that's Stephen fixing the lorries. All the lorries are a huge job. Stephen spent most of last year during COVID traveling the five, four, five hundred miles between us and the Copper Belt, bringing up the supplies. That's Sean preaching uh, in the open air. Well, we try to, there's a lot of preaching all the time, either around this connected with the assembly. And on Sunday, the assembly gospel message at nine o'clock, it goes from the, like here, it's, it goes by shortwave radio over to the hospital. So you have about 100 people in the hospital here in the gospel message uh, every Sunday. And then in the hospital itself, we have a similar system and the speakers scheduled from Monday to Saturday to preach the gospel for 10 to 15 minutes um, at, the, um, at that uh, the microphone. And I, I do Friday, um, uh, usually in, in Linda that is. Um, parcels come, have to be sorted, and uh, Lorraine is very busy. I, I, I don't take time to go into her work today, but just to say our wives uh, uh, on mission work in Africa are just as busy as we are. And uh, it takes a lot of work to sort those parcels, bring everything up to the hospital, and put it in a place where it's found. But that's only one of multiple tasks. Uh, Laurie came from Northern Ireland. And uh, this is Medical Missionary News. We're very thankful for the things that we get from, out the, from Medical Missionary News. It, me medicines are the lifeblood of the hospital. And uh, these would come out to us uh, uh, several times a year. That's the Spicinger family, Joey and Caitlin. Joey's the airplane mechanic and Caitlin a nurse and uh, all of their, their four children. Keith and Gail uh, run a dormitory for girls, and that's uh, the girls. Uh, and uh, during term time, these girls will stay in this dormitory, and Keith will have meetings for them. Friday night, they have a little gospel meeting, get together, and a number of the girls could see it. And uh, very often when they go away, they look back, uh, send them letters if they trusted the Lord afterwards. This is Rodney and Margaret Strachan. Rodney's a radiologist and his wife is a teacher. They, I, I was in Balamoni one night and they um, got to the door and the brother says, do you, do you, somebody in Australia wants to know, do you have any place for a radiologist in your mission hospitals in Africa? And <clears throat> so we got in touch with Rodney. Rodney came out and he digitalized all our x-rays. That was the first thing he did. And then he... Um, so what happens now is I can get an x-ray done in the morning uh, of a patient at 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, say. It goes straight to Australia on the internet. Rodney, Australia is 12 hours ahead of us, so Rodney's just coming off his work. He reports on it immediately, and the patient can be going home at 11 o'clock with an official report uh, from a consultant radiologist. And so a lot of our services are, are pretty good. Uh, Simon Porter from Banbridge has started to help him with that. And he's very thankful uh, for, for that help. I think the Loma Hospital in Shavuma and places have joined in as well. Do pray for this man, Dr. Felix Chibwe. He's been the big bright spot in my last two years because he's a very gifted Zambian surgeon. He's a lovely brother in the assembly. He can preach uh, a great uh, either gospel or great ministry and would do anywhere. So. Uh, do pray for him. We hope that he will stay with us. His wife's Nosia, and they have two children uh, who go to Sakeji School. But if you don't remember much else that I say today, remember Dr. Felix. And uh, it's been a big uh, sharing of workload that I, now. Those are the surgical procedures. This year we're over, well over a thousand already. And uh, it's a busy, very active place. Um, how do you describe? How do you describe the hospital? Well. You can't really, but you go in in the morning and you 
We start at 7.30 and anything can be happening. You do a ward round, you can see almost any type of surgery, hernias, prostates, hysterectomies, <laughs> you name it. And that's, you know, all those patients are in the wards. And then you um, have uh, the children's ward. Dr. Ross usually looks after that. But it's just uh, chock-a-block with ch children. Into the maternity ward is the same. Little premature babies in, you know, like neonates and things like that. Um, all in one building, if you can imagine that, but different rooms. But, um, and we try to keep the gospel central to it all. So a lot of our, build, a lot of our um, walls in the hospital have got texts. We have lots of um, uh, tracts. We have Bibles everywhere, or, or certainly in certain places. And uh, if patients are getting surgery, well, then we, have, uh, we always pray for the patient. Uh, during the uh, during the surgery or before the surgery, well, that's the sort of operating list. It keeps you busy. Uh, Lorraine sometimes assists with operating if uh, I can't find anybody else. <laughs> the uh, she's very good actually. I mean, that's a joke. Um, the uh, lots of operations, cataracts here. We do this. We. We, uh, this is three cataract patients uh, done. John Chiland is a good brother. He uh, is very, uh, this is him here, sorry, I'm watching this one. <laughs> and, and then this is Mark, and uh, or, sorry, this one's um, Mark uh, Gratton and his wife Joanne, and uh, they're uh, Eloise. Um, they're based in Lusaka. Do remember them in prayer as well. Uh, Mark does aircraft engineering, and Joanne comes up to us every yeah, they've come up about twice a year now since they came, and Joanne does glasses, so a lot of our patients can get glasses and so on. Brass tacks, I've had a, a huge input at the place, so I can't go into that now. Then uh, Philip first, uh, Phil Kennedy first met this child in Angola when he was doing the hospital at Mary, at Mary Ratters. He's come back and uh, he found the child, that's took a look at getting his leg fixed. Uh, remember uh, Julie Rachel, huge hard working person. JR can do anything a doctor can do. Works night and day, really. She's probably the hardest worker amongst us, I would say. And, uh, you know, very gifted in all the maternity work. Dr. Ross is a very gifted uh, pediatrician. She's there half time, part, mostly there and sometimes at home then. But she's about 30 beds in the children's ward. She looks after them. If she's not there, then they fall back, uh, they fall back to us. Uh, we often ask our patients, why do you come to Chitokaloki? And they say, well, it's because of the care you give us, because of the love you show to us. And that, I think, is a very high uh, recommendation, so it is. Uh, anything, let's just, uh, lots of tracks. Brother Martin there and Juana. Juana's a nurse, does a lot of uh, evangelism work around the hospital. And he recently had a thing for young men. He uh, took them through Bible studies, and they trusted the Lord. Uh, two, of, two or three of them trusted the Lord. They were baptized last year, and now in the assembly, and uh, doing a good work for God. Lots of children, pediatrics, malaria, the blood transfusion, the life of the flesh is the blood thereof, still through today. Uh, patients with uh, Bibles in the ward. Uh, nurses, the uh, government send uh, 20 to 30 nurses every few months, and so every Tuesday and Thursday, either me, Gordon, or Dr. Chiwe will have a little gospel meeting there, just for 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, they, they, we, they get the gospel in. This is Chris and Alison. Chris is our pilot, Alison a nurse, and uh, they do a lot of work. Chris uh, is often away flying. The, the plane is a, is a great... Uh, is a great thing, and uh, we uh, often would uh, make use of it. Used to fly to to visit Betty here every Monday. COVID has hit that quite a bit, but uh, we would go in every Monday. And uh, I was I'll talk about Betty this afternoon. See, I've never run out of time, and it would take several hours to tell you everything about Betty. But uh, it's just been wonderful to work with her. You know, we're both from Banbridge. And uh, Betty, uh, Betty and me uh, uh, are from the, the assembly there. And 
So we commit uh, the following to you. Time is gone as usual. Um, that's, uh, I'll come back to Josh this afternoon. Prayer points. Pray, be thankful and encouraged at the work that's going on at Chitoka Loki. I, I, I didn't say, but you know, hospital work is 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. It never stops. So every day, every minute of every day, there's something happening there, uh, something going on, and somebody talking to somebody about the Lord. And so do, do be thankful. Pray for Dr. Felix. Pray for the building up of the assemblies. Brother Jeff Spicinger had an accident. I didn't go into that, but remember that. Uh, and pray for De- De Balata. Now that Betty has gone, it's a huge, huge gap, a huge chasm. Uh, but pray for uh, Betty settling in at home. And pray for Mark and Janelle Highcup who are taking up the work there. And pray for health and strength for us all. We're all getting older, and it's not... Uh, doesn't always feel so good. But what's the point of doing, you know, why do we do the medical work? It brings so many people in under the sound of the gospel. And i just give you two things. Um, I was standing the other day talking to Sister Rhoda, who's very good at personal work. And Rhoda said, she says, I want to tell you about this man, doctor. This was a very religious man. He was trusting in his church for salvation but he's just realized that he needs to trust in Jesus. And that man had found the Lord at Chitoka Loki Hospital. Uh, about a month ago, before I came, I was standing in the ICU unit. We had lost a patient after much, much uh, trying, over a year and a half. A man, he had a thing in his, his, his throat. And I was standing there rather dejected, to be honest, in the ICU. And uh, Rhoda came up and says, why are you sad, doctor? She says, you do remember, don't you, that six weeks ago, he trusted the Lord. And she said, I told him, I talked to him yesterday, and he was very firm in his salvation, and he knew that he was going to heaven. And that was just before he, he died. Um, just last night, I was, uh, Dr. Ross said, she told me, two boys, two young boys have professed to trust the Lord this week at the, at the hospital. And she, one was a little boy, David, who has a huge facial tumor. And it was spreading all over his face. We finally got a biopsy of it. And he was able to get some chemotherapy, which has reduced it considerably. But it's wonderful that he has now been spurred to trust the Lord. And she said, another little boy from Portugal, he, he came up to her and he said, he very politely walked up to her and shook her hand and said that he had trusted Jesus uh, that day, so, or that week. So we thank God for all those things. And we thank God for your care and your support and fellowship over uh, many years now. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Let's just pray together, shall we? Lord, we've been challenged to consider the brevity of life and our response to your saving grace in our lives. And uh, we've heard that Um, illustrated really just in one of the last examples David gave of uh, the person who died on the operating table but who had trusted you. Lord, we um, thank you for all the work that's been shared from Chitokoloki and Chivuma and Dipalata, uh, and we hold all the people who've been mentioned before you and pray that uh, you will uphold them and enable them and bless them and we pray for the um, spread of the gospel through these centers in Jesus name. Amen. Now in keeping with our theme of footsteps worth following, um, we hope that everyone's got a copy of our anniversary book, if not they're available here. We have included in our program here in Northern Ireland two um, historical um, pictures of people who've served who were from this area. And we're now going to see um, a video on T. Ernest Wilson, the author of uh, Angola Beloved. This has been put together by David Wilson, his grandson, who is here today somewhere. Where are you? There you are, David. Yeah, thank you very much for all the work that you've put into um, making this um, video and um, the resources that are available that he'll be mentioning. So we're going to see that now. Thank you.
It is an honor and a pleasure for me to have been asked to share this brief overview of the life and ministry of my grandparents, T. Ernest and Elizabeth Wilson. From the time that he left Belfast in 1923, my grandfather kept a journal which became the basis for his autobiographical book, Angola Beloved, that was published in 1967 by Lawazer Brothers. Grandpa gave me a copy of the book for Christmas in 1982. We are glad that Gospel Folio Press reprinted the book in 2007, and if nothing else, I hope that this presentation will encourage another generation of young Christians to read his story of God's faithfulness and be challenged to step out in service for the Lord in simple dependence upon him. Angola is located on the west coast of Central Africa. Ernest Wilson was born in Belfast in May of 1902, and he was born again in May of 1918 in a little wooden hall on Fulton Street in Belfast. Just a month later, he was baptized and received into fellowship in the assembly that meets at Donegal Road Gospel Hall. And then it was in October of 19. 23, that he was commended to God's grace by Donegal Road Gospel Hall at just 21 years of age. Ernest grew up reading biographies of missionaries like David Livingston, Fred Stanley Arnott, and Mary Slessor. Afterward, he was saved. He was advised to get a good Bible and a good alarm clock. I remember him saying one time someone was asking him how he was able to get up so early in the morning, and he said, well, when the alarm clock goes off, I reach across, I grab the covers, I pull them aside, swing my feet around, put my feet on the floor, and stand up, and I'm up for the day. And he gave himself in those early years of his Christian life uh, to reading God's Word, to studying God's Word, uh, while serving his five-year apprenticeship at Harland and Wolf Shipyard. Uh, his dinner times were spent there studying the Scriptures with a group of godly men at the shipyard. His Saturday afternoons in the summer were spent with other keen believers evangelizing across counties Antrim and Down. He was deeply impacted by reading about the faith and convictions of people like Hudson Taylor and George Mueller. In 1921, Fred Lane, an English missionary, came to Belfast and gave a report on the unevangelized north of Angola. Ernest was deeply burdened by this report, and after three years of prayer and correspondence with Mr. Lane, he spoke with the elders of the assembly, who extended to him the right hand of fellowship and commended him to the grace of God. This is his letter of commendation, written on the 10th of October, 1923. In his book, Angola Beloved, he wrote, I left Ireland in October, 1923, with a third-class ticket to take me as far as Lisbon in Portugal, but with no passage money beyond that, no supplies, and without a promise of support from anyone. I felt I wanted to simply trust God from day to day and try honestly to put into practice the principles I had learned from the Bible. I wanted to satisfy myself whether the principle of simple faith in God would work or not. After over 40 years of testing and varied experience, I can gladly testify that it does. So he arrived in Portugal in October of 1923 for 10 months of language study. Then in 1924, he sailed from Lisbon to the port city of Lobito in Angola, right on the coast there. When I landed in Lobito, he said, in 1924, it was still undeveloped. There was only one primitive hotel infested with bugs and cockroaches and no modern plumbing. I slept on a table the two nights there. It would have been more comfortable sleeping on the warm sand outside. But here at last I had my feet on African soil, the ambitions of many years realized. As I thought of the unknown future in the interior of Africa, I prayed, O oh Lord, give me three years and I will be satisfied. Having arrived in Lobido, he then traveled on to Chilanda Mission Station in the BA region of the country, then on to Capango Mission Station, and then finally moved to Holando Mission Station in BA, where he served the next 18 months while learning the Umbundu language. He says four things are necessary in learning a language. First of all, to have a good working knowledge of the grammar of one's own language. It seems foolish for one to attempt to master a foreign tongue when one doesn't know his own. Secondly, it is important to have a good musical ear to distinguish differences in tone. A deaf person would have difficulty in mastering a language. Thirdly, one must have a good memory to retain what he hears. Fourthly, one should be something of a mimic to reproduce what is heard. 
In April of 1925, he made an expedition to the Bangala country in the unevangelized north, but realized that it was not suitable there for a mission station. He then traveled south to Chitutu between the Songo, Songo and Chokwi tribes and requested permission from the Portuguese authorities to establish a mission station there. He writes about the, the principles he learned, he says, as a result of this first survey of the unevangelized north of Angola. I came to a few sobering conclusions. First, to do any lasting work would be the task of a lifetime. Secondly, it would be a life of isolation. There was not much possibility that the country would be opened up to civilization in our generation. Thirdly, it would mean learning two more languages, Chokwi and Songo. The latter had not yet been committed to writing. And last but not least, it was not a job for a single man. So in 1925, he traveled 300 miles from Holanda to Lumakasai to start learning Chokwi and to visit Elizabeth Smith. While in Portugal, I had met and seen a good deal of Elizabeth Smith of Hartford, Connecticut, who was also interested in pioneer work in virgin territory. Elizabeth seemed to me the ideal of a pioneer among primitive people. She had gone into missionary work of her own volition. We had common ideals and ambitions. I decided to pay Luma Kasai a visit and venture to ask her if she would share my life among the Songo people. That meant a walk of 300 miles each way. In between lay the hungry country. The journey from Holanda to Lumakasai in Chokwiland occupied 16 days, but my walk of 600 miles was rewarded. We decided to get married the next year. So in June of 1927, Ernest married Elizabeth. Their honeymoon consisted of a 13-day walk to Chitutu. Before their wedding, Dr. Laura Jacobs had cared for Ernest through numerous bouts of malaria. When he traveled to the wedding, she sent a letter with him to Elizabeth. On opening the doctor's letter, Elizabeth found that she had sent her warm congratulations on our wedding, but added, I'm sorry to tell you that you are marrying this man to bury him, for he is full of malaria. After nearly 40 years, the dying man is still here, and good Dr. Jacobs has long since gone to her reward. Here's a picture of Ernest and Elizabeth on their wedding day. The suit he ordered didn't arrive, and he had to borrow a tweed suit from a man much larger than he was. After settling in Chitutu, they had to learn the Songo language. Ernest was already able to speak Portuguese, Umbundu, and Chokwi, but the Songo language had not yet been committed to writing. He contracted with a man called Mukishi to help him learn Songo. Mukishi spoke Umbundu and Chokwi and had passable Portuguese, though he himself was illiterate. There were no professing Christians among the Songo, and they were suspicious, so the work started with Chokwi villages nearby. In March of 1928, they traveled to Lumakasai for the birth of their first son, David. Dr. Jacobs delivered the baby with the help of Susan McRae, a nurse. There were complications, but these skilled medical workers saved Elizabeth's life. Later that year, in November 1928, Elizabeth came down with Blackwater fever. God graciously intervened in answer to their prayers, and they were able to transport her on a hammock to a mission station where Dr. Jacobs nursed her back to health. In 1929 and 1930, they were advised to go back because of their health uh, for a period of furlough. Uh, when they returned, in 1932, my father, Tom, was born, and in 1934, my aunt, Anne, was born. Here's a picture of the young family and uh, the family a few years later. Uh, another furlough followed in 1937 and 1938, and then in 1940, they moved to Kapango in BA, in that central part of the country, to work among the Umbundu-speaking people. During the years in Kapango, they focused on small regional Bible schools to strengthen the local believers. They also made regular trips to encourage and strengthen local assemblies, not only those planted by missionaries, but also those that had been started by African evangelists. During the next 20 years, he made extensive travels not only in Angola, but also to what is now Zambia and Zimbabwe, and as far south as Cape Town in South Africa. Let me recommend for you as well, uh, my brother has put together a website, tearnestwilson.com, uh, that has uh, articles and books by my grandfather, messages that he wrote, but also very helpfully some letters uh, that he wrote during that time, particularly 
letters that were sent uh, to echoes of service. Here's an excerpt from a letter in 1955. Last night, Brother Shorten, Charlie Shorten, and I got back from a trip to a place called Katapi, about halfway between B.A. and Chokwiland, and in the heart of what we used to call the Hungry Country. A remarkable work is going on there. It was started and is being carried on by two Chokwi brethren called Kusindala and Kompandia. When I went there for the first time last year, there was an assembly with about 60 in fellowship. This time we found the assembly had increased to 80, and a large crowd of about 500 were waiting for us. These came from 13 scattered communities, which have been evangelized by these two brethren. A group of 25 had walked three days to be there. The gospel hall, built by the free, voluntary labor of the believers, was too small, so we had the meetings in a large grass enclosure. There are good prospects of a new assembly being planted at a place called Tetela, opened up by these same two men. They have pushed out into the Lukaze tribe in isolated places where no white missionary has been. Let me bring a final challenge to you as we close. These early pioneer missionaries, like the first century Macedonia believers, first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. They were willing to turn their backs on family and friends, realizing that they may never return. Ernest wrote to Fred Arnott in 1923. He was only 21 years old, but he says, After coming here, I felt very lonely at times as I thought of loved ones I might never see again. But now the Lord has more than made up for that with a realized sense of his own presence. I think never since the Lord saved me have I had as much liberty in secret prayer as now and also the word of God is doubly sweet. It seemed as if when every human prop was taken away, it was only to fall into the everlasting arms. Yes, it is still true that they who trust him wholly find him wholly true. May the Lord raise up another generation of pioneers with a fresh vision to reach this world and to see new assemblies established to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, David for that inspiring uh, story. And what a challenge, the next generation. That's what we're thinking about. Let's um, sing our next hymn, which is Rejoice the Lord is King. We're going to be taking up an offering um, during the singing of this hymn. And I'll invite all those who are able to to stand now and let's sing together.
Please be seated. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Andy to the platform to share um, his report on his work in Rome. Thank you very much. Buongiorno. Good morning. Let me teach you some Italian. A very simple sentence, easy to remember. Io amo l'Italia. Okay, let's try repeating. Io amo l'Italia. And probably most of you are able to understand what I'm getting you to say. I love Italy. And uh, I think that is an experience uh, or a truth for most people. Anyone who has had the privilege to travel to Italy, to explore great cities like Rome, like uh, Naples, like Venice, like Florence, it's hard not to love Italy. Great food, gelato, pizza, pasta, great coffee, uh, great scenery, great art, great history. Italy is truly a remarkable place. And I have had the privilege of living in Italy for over two thirds of my life. I'm 36 years old and I've lived in Italy altogether for 26 years. My parents were missionaries down in uh, Naples. And so I was brought up in Naples, and then when I finished schooling in Italy, I returned to Northern Ireland, I returned to my home country, followed the biblical model, came to find wife. Uh, uh, we didn't meet at a well, but I did find wife, and then returned back uh, to Italy. So my timekeeping is two-thirds Italian and one-third Northern Irish. And I really would like you to go away this morning with a renewed and increased love for Italy. Uh, we all love the food, we love the scenery, we love the art, we love the history. But I would also like you to have a, a passion or understand something of the passion that I have, that many have for the country of Italy. Because although Italy offers so much from a spiritual perspective, it's a very dark place. Italy has never known a time of reformation. Italy has never experienced a significant time of gospel breakthrough. The majority of people in Italy today, I would say, have never heard the gospel. That doesn't mean that they don't have access to the gospel. Of course, they have access to the gospel. They have access to scripture. They have access to many resources online. But I would say that most Italians have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel proclaimed, announced, or articulated to them. So there is a significant need in Italy because we have a population of, over, of close to 60 million people. And I would say most of these people have yet to hear the gospel. So how do you respond to such a big need in Italy? It's easy to feel overwhelmed because of the need that there is in Italy. Well, I have the privilege of serving at eBay. Now, that's not the online uh, auction website. eBay is uh, Istituto biblico evangelico italiano that is the italian uh, evangelical biblical institute and it's a bible college which is located in the outskirts of rome and the vision of ebay the vision of the bible college is really to serve and to equip italians so that italians are able to reach their nation with the gospel because the need is so great in italy there's a need to multiply workers, multiply people who have a heart and have the ability and have the gifting of sharing the gospel in Italy. And so we have this Bible college in the outskirts of Rome, and 
the goal of the college is to equip especially young Italian believers in their knowledge of Scripture. Uh, they will come to Rome, they will spend up to three years with us in Rome, and really their primary occupation during those three years is to study Scripture. They go away having studied every book of the Bible. They have a good grasp of the story of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. And they go away having had the opportunity to study in depth some of the key doctrines of the Christian faith. But we don't just help them uh, from, the knowledge, from a knowledge point of view. We also want our students to sharpen the gifting and the abilities that the Lord has given them. And so they will have practical experience. They will work alongside local churches. They will be sent away in placement for several weeks at a time so that they can foster and sharpen the gifts that the Lord has given them. And as well as working on their knowledge and their competence, we also try to work on their character. And as you know, this is the most difficult aspect. It's much easier to download information. It's much easier to give knowledge. It's much harder and it's a work of the Lord ultimately to change and to transform our students. But we long to see godly men and women who have a burden to share the gospel in Italy. We have the residential school in the outskirts of Rome, and typically we have a small group of about 10 or 12 students who will live on campus for a period of up to three years. It's a small community, it's an intense life uh, together, but it's also a great uh, opportunity for people to be prepared and equipped for ministry. Uh, the group that, that you see here is the, the students that we have this year, and then this was the group of students that we had last year. And so we'd ask you to pray for these young people who have dedicated up to three years of their life to be prepared to serve the Lord. The man on the, uh, on the slide is Daniele Pasquale. He is the new principal at, at eBay, and I would ask you to pray especially for him as he takes on this new role. I've had the privilege of serving at eBay for 10 years, and so I'm now at a stage where I can see and follow the stories of some of our former students. So let me just share with you some information about our former students. Here in this picture, we have Davide and Deborah, and they studied at eBay. Uh, Davide studied for three years. Deborah studied for one year. Of course, they met at eBay, they fell in love, uh, they got married, and they're now serving the Lord in the outskirts of Milan. A young couple, uh, gifted, David is a gifted evangelist, and they're working in the outskirts of Milan, planting a church. There are many parts of the city of Milan, or of many cities in Italy, there are many towns and villages that don't have any evangelical witness, any evangelical church. And so it's a real joy to see this couple who are working and who are planting a church there in the outskirts of Milan. And they've been doing it for the last few years, and they have a small group of 16, 17 believers who meet every weekend. And so it's a real encouragement for us to see the work that they are now doing. And then another former student is Giancarlo, Giancarlo Villarta. He's originally from the Philippines, uh, but he's been br brought up in Italy, and he has just recently completed his studies at eBay, and he's returned to Venice, where he lives, and he's helping lead both an Italian church and a Filipino church, and the Lord is using him to strengthen and to bless the church there in Venice. As well as the residential program, we also have extension schools, we understand that it's not possible for many Italian believers to leave their context, to leave their jobs, their families, to come to Rome to study for an intense period. So because of this, we have these extension schools where instead of the students traveling to us, coming to Rome, 
Uh, those of us who are involved in the teaching will travel to some of these key cities in Italy to deliver intense weekend of, weekends of teaching. And of course, the advantage is that you're not removing people from their context, but you're serving people who are already active in their service for God in their local churches. At the moment, we have an extension school in Milan, we have one in Turin, and we also have one in Albania. And over the next few months, we are hoping to start a new extension school in Rome, close to where we are, and also one down in the region of Puglia. Over the last 25 years, eBay has had more than 30 extension schools. And typically in an extension school, you'll have about 15 or 20 students who commit to receive training for a period up to four years. And the advantage of the extension school is that you'll have current leaders or the next generation of leaders who are training together from several churches in the same area and who are being equipped to serve the Lord. As well as the extension schools, we also have the, our online programs. So it's impossible for us to have extension schools in every city of Italy. And so we, have, we give the opportunity for Italian believers who want to study, who want to deepen their knowledge of scripture to study through the online program. And at the moment, we have more than 70 students who are enrolled on the online program. Let me ask you to pray for Ricardo and Eleonora, the couple that you see on the slide. They're also former students. They've recently finished the three-year study in Rome, and they have now taken on the responsibility for coordinating the online program. So again, it's a real encouragement to see people who have studied, who have been trained, and who are now actively serving the Lord. So let me invite you to remember the work of eBay and to pray for eBay. Uh, Echoes have been a great help to us over many, many years, and we're really grateful of that. We're also involved in a local church, in a local assembly. Um, I have the privilege of being one of the elders uh, of the church in Rome. Technically, I would also have the title of being Bishop of Rome. <laughs> Um, but I don't tend to use that particular title for obvious, uh, obvious reasons. Um, but we are really privileged to be part of a, a, a vibrant church in the outskirts of Rome. We have a congregation of, of about 80 or 90 uh, believers. Uh, most of them would be Italian believers. And uh, the church was planted I would say about 30 years ago by the former principal of the Bible College. And it's a real privilege for us uh, um, today to be involved with this church. The church has a real zeal for evangelism. Uh, the, many of the believers will be actively involved in various ministries seeking to share the gospel. Um, the church has had a presence in the local market for over 30 years. And it's great to see people who were first contacted through the ministry in the market who are, have become believers and who are now leading that ministry. Uh, the church is also involved with uh, a food bank uh, to help people in financial difficulty. And once again, the goal is not just to offer some practical help, but to offer that which is most precious, offer the gospel to our neighborhood. And so I would ask you to pray for the Church of Roma Finocchio and pray for their efforts in evangelism. Connected to the church, uh, we also have a center for migrants in Rome. The advantage of living in a city like Rome is not only that you can reach Italians, but in a sense, the world <laughs> comes to Rome. And so you're able to connect with people from many different uh, nationalities. And we have an American couple who work with us in Rome, uh, Todd and Christy Kincaid, and their primary ministry is to run this center. And in the center, they offer practical help. Uh, they teach English, they teach Italian, uh, they help people with uh, the Italian bureaucracy, 
which is a full-time job. Um, they also help children with their homework. But again, they also take the opportunity to share the gospel. And uh, Mazuma, the young man that you see in the picture, uh, he became a Christian through the Chintyo Agape, and he is now one of the leaders who is running it. Um, the Book of Acts finishes in a, quite a bizarre way. The, uh, the Book of Acts is the story of the gospel that starts from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it finishes with the Apostle Paul who is in the house arrest and people come to him and he proclaims the kingdom of God and he teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a sense in which, of course, Rome was the center of the world back then. Still today, there are people from many nationalities who come to Rome. Some of these countries, it would be hard to enter into these countries to preach the gospel. And so it's a great opportunity when people come to Rome and to have the opportunity to proclaim the kingdom of God and to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just finish by telling you about my family. It's always tempting to talk about ministry, talk about Bible college, talk about church and the migrant center. But I would also really value uh, prayer for, uh, for my family. So we have uh, uh, three children together with my wife, Ruth. Ruth is originally from Waringstown, so not too far uh, from, from here. Um, and uh, she is a primary school teacher and she's able to teach in a local international school not far from where we live. And we have three children. We have Isaiah, the oldest boy, who's 10 years old, and he's a, a Ferrari fan. <laughs> he enjoys playing wa water polo. And then we have Holly, who loves gymnastics. And then we have the little one, uh, Joshua, who loves creating trouble. That's what he, that seems to be his, his speciality. Uh, I would ask you to pray for us as, uh, as a family. Uh, we long to, we're giving our life to help others find their identity in Christ, come to salvation in Christ, seeing others and especially young Italians who are active in the service for the Lord. But we, we have the same desire for our own children and for our own kids. So we would ask you also to pray for us as a family, especially in trying to balance all the ministry commitments with time invested in our family. So what's our sentence? Io amo l'Italia. And perhaps every time that you appreciate something of Italy, ice cream, coffee, pizza, perhaps you could also stop and pray for Italy and for the great spiritual need that there is in Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for Andy and Ruth, for Isaiah, Holly, and Joshua, and we hold them before you and ask that you will bless them together as a family as they seek to serve you in, in Rome. We thank you for um, eBay. We thank you for the principal and the students. Would you be working amongst them uh, in, in these days? We thank you for former students and for church plants in Milan and Venice and uh, pray that you will establish these, um, these works. We thank you for their local church on the outskirts of Rome and pray that you will um, bless them as a fellowship and in all their outreach. We thank you for the migrant center that reaches uh, the world on their doorstep. And we pray that you will bring people to know you through that outreach, we pray. So we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're very pleased to have um, Ben. Um, ben is going to come and share with us uh, about First Serve. Um, ben has been on the First Serve program, and he's currently a second-year student at Cardiff University studying geology. And uh, he's, he's going to share with us. Thank you. 
Uh, hi everyone, good morning. Hope you are all well. So I'm here representing FirstServe. We've got a stand over there. Feel free to talk to me, take a leaflet, take a funky wristband. Now some of you may ask, what is FirstServe? Some of you may know what FirstServe is. Some of you might not even fit the demographic for what FirstServe is. But everyone will know someone between the ages of 18 and 25. So if you fit that now, you're too young, or you know someone who fits that demographic, please tell them about it. So first serve is a sort of a gap year, six months, for people 18 to 25, set up by Echoes International, Glow, who also have a stand over there, and Counties. It is a sort of a three-part gap year where you um, learn to serve, serve local, and serve global. So this is just a sort of a short little presentation about my experience as part of FirstServe. So in the Learn to Serve section, I spent um, two and a half months at um, Tilsey College, um, Bible College set up by Glow in Motherwell, just south of Glasgow in Scotland. So, so I spent two months there, learned lots of sort of theological knowledge of different books of the Bible, pneumatology, Christian ethics, just to sort of outline some of those kind of topics that we learnt about. But I was only there for a couple of months, but we were there and we got to really know and become really close with a lot of the friends that me and the other guys as part of, as part of First Serve got to know. We got to know the local area very well as it was during lockdown, so we couldn't get up to much. Um, but I really appreciated sort of the theological grounding that um, this course gave me into the rest of my gap year, but also going into university because it allowed me to think about some certain topics and go, actually, this is now what I think, this is now what I believe going into university. Um, but the, sort of the second part of the programme was sort of serving locally in a church. So you typically do some of this for four to six weeks as part of the standard program, but I was there during COVID. So I was blessed with being able to um, be part of Hebron Evangelical Church for two and a half months um, in Carlisle. So I went with a fellow first server, Amy, and we got to be there for two and a half months and got involved in varying different parts of the church from kids work to youth work to some of their homeless outreach. Um, but I think what was really cool, I was, um, I was ready to sort of go full in and help with whatever the church had to offer. But the church leaders also offered me the chance to um, preach and do some sort of Sunday morning ministry. So at this, uh, this church, I actually preached for the very first time. And the church, uh, one of the church leaders got behind me and really involved and wanted to help me. He didn't write it for me, but he helped me sort of put it together and actually sort of... Um, teach the church. Um, that photo was from a live stream. Um, it is technically still on the YouTube channel somewhere, if you could find it. Um, but it was also very much at the heart, in the heart of sort of Cumbria in the Lake District. So many weekends just sort of walking the hills of the Lake District. But I think what was also really nice is that we were put up by a host family from the church who were really connected and that we could actually get involved and serve alongside with them, which was really nice as well. So, but because my, so my time during first serve was during sort of 2021, so really peak COVID season. So as I said, there was the sort of this learn to serve, which I did at Tilsey College, serve local at Hebron. But then I was supposed to do my international section over sort of that following summer, which really didn't come about due to um, COVID happening. So, I've spent, so I spent the next year, sort of 2021, 2022 academic year, going and doing university, living life at university, joining the Christian Union. And then this summer, I actually spent um, two months um, serving in Argentina. Um, so I worked with Eba and Fiona Galito, as well as um, Rick Isra, as well as James Burnett, who are from sort of the Glasgow area in Scotland and got involved with what they're doing. So I traveled to Argentina. I think the total travel time was like 30, 32, 36 hours door to door, which was quite long, but we were, so we were there. And I got involved with a lot of sort of the teaching and evangelism aspect. 
that I came to really love in my sort of church placement section. So we were there in the city of um, Palina, in um, Entre Rios, which is kind of north of Buenos Aires. So I got involved with lots of the church activities, sort of, um, sort of notably a lot of sort of evangelism stuff. So me and Eber, he trained me in a lot of sort of their evangelism tactics or methods, and we would be invited into people's houses, talk with them, talk to random people on the street. Um, but I was also given the opportunity to travel up to the sort of north of the country. And we visited a sort of a young people's camp, and which was great because it was all just people my age. And we actually got to go and I preached with them and I just really sort of got to know them. But it was really cool to see these kind of up and coming sort of young leaders of what would be the church in a few years in Argentina. Um, but as part of my time, I got to visit loads of different types of churches in Argentina as well. And what it really meant to be, we were in a really remote place of the country, really far north in the province of Chaco. And we got to see how church just comes together and sort of lives in community. Everyone had a role, everyone was doing something as part of the church conference that we were at. And I, but during my time, I also really wanted to go sort of full in and experience the culture. I'm a big kind of foodie, and I really enjoyed a lot of the food and the culture that Argentina had to offer. And I arrived in Argentina knowing zero Spanish. I got off the plane into a taxi for six hours with a taxi driver that spoke zero English, and me who spoke zero Spanish. So our communication was coffee, and where is the toilet when we, when we stopped off? But I, I went from like speaking zero Spanish and pretty much daily Spanish lessons to be able to go up to someone in the street on the final week and tell them the gospel in Spanish, which I thought was really cool. But every first server has kind of a different opportunity. So Amy, uh, my friend from first serve, who I spent most of my time with in sort of my first section, um, she actually went out and served in Thailand over the summer, which, and she had a very different experience than I did, and she was serving a lot with sort of people in the, almost in the midst of a war zone as they were bordering Myanmar. But people have gone out to um, Zambia, to um, Bolivia, India, and it's all really quite interesting. But if you do want to know more, we do have a stand over there next to Glow. Please come and talk to me. I will be more than willing to tell you more about it. Thank you very much, Ben, for sharing your experience of the First Serve Gap Year program. And do come and uh, speak to Ben uh, if you'd like to find out more. So Jim is now going to come and give an update with Echoes International. Thank you. Thanks, Rupert. Technically, I have 10 minutes, but I've probably got about four. So I'll try and keep this as uh, compact as I can. This is, a, as we've said already, this is our 150th year. Um, and we wanted to celebrate that for two reasons. And the first reason was actually to look back and to give God thanks for what he's done. And that's part of the exhibition. So hopefully you take the time to do that uh, when you're here and start to feel and see uh, what's going on. But the second part, actually, was also to then think about the challenge of what God is going to do and our part in that. And that's very much uh, something that's come through from the conference already. Um, each of the folk have presented have given that challenge of our response, this generation, what are we going to do? And if you think of the 150 years, and actually probably 30, 40 years before that, the need of the world was the gospel. And those men and women, they gave up everything to see their generation one for Christ. And that's quite inspiring. And it's good to look back from a historical perspective, but it's also really important to think about, well, what's my response? How do I respond to that? What's my role in mission? 
And that's the challenge of today, really. And if you think of what happened over the last 150-odd years, God started to change huge countries. South America, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, Europe, where the gospel was preached and men and women believed and countries were transformed. But yet, that 42%, that represents the part of the world that is still unevangelized. Vast parts of our world uh, don't know who the Lord Jesus is. And the challenge of mission is not so much just to think about where God is and the strength of the assembly is all through the world, and it's great to be, be encouraged by that, but also how do we respond to that challenge? And what, what happens about the 42%? And there's all sorts of different ways that those folk who are unreached can be reached. Andy spoke earlier on about the migrants who are coming to Europe. That's an opportunity to evangelize people who would not normally have an opportunity to hear the gospel. But as I got ready for this, I, something struck me. I was looking at a course um, about uh, mission. And one of the parts in the course was talking about changing your perspective. And I'm going to do a little bit of that today. Um, because I was quite encouraged by what I read. It was an encouragement to know what God is doing in the world today. And the reason I got quite excited by that, I remember about 12 years ago, my first experience of cross-cultural mission was in Angola, actually. I spent some time with Ruth Hadley. And I remember in particular one visit, we were going through from Luanda to Sarimo, and we passed by all these villages and towns. And just about in every town and village, as we passed through, Ruth would say, there's the assembly there. That's the assembly. We're passing by the assembly there. And it was just an encouragement to think of what God has done in a country over 70 odd years. And so I was encouraged by that. I'm going to try and encourage you. So hopefully I will do that over the next couple of slides. Um, 7.9 billion people in our world today. That's roughly the population. And this is roughly the breakup of that population. 10% it's estimated are evangelical Christians, disciples of the Lord Jesus across the whole of the world. 20% 20, 20 of them would be described as nominal Christians. And we've got folks in the world, in the UK, who would describe themselves as Christian, but they are not trusting the Lord Jesus as their saviour. And about 40% of the world have access to the gospel. So they either have a church in their town, or they, they know of believers, or they, they know who Jesus is, and they've heard the message, or they know what the gospel is about. But 30% of the world have no access to the gospel whatsoever. They don't know a Christian. They've never picked up a Bible. They've never heard a verse. They know nothing of the Lord Jesus. And that's our challenge in our day and in our generation. Back to the 42%. You may be thinking, why is it not 30%? 42% is the unreached. But there are some who have got connections. There are some who have got access. Not great, but they've got access. But 30% have no idea. John and I were talking to Harry Lannan a number of months ago, and he describes a conversation with a man from Afghanistan in a park in Greece. And as Harry spoke to um, that person, um, he had no idea of the Lord Jesus. Never heard the message. Never had a Bible. Never heard of the Lord dying on the cross for him. And he was able just to share that. For the first time, he heard that message. And he's still corresponding with him as well. But just to encourage you even more, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. And I got quite encouraged by this, so I'm going to encourage you as well. So first of all, to think about what God is doing at this present moment or over the last number of years. So in the Philippines, for instance, 1975, it's reckoned there are about 3,000 churches. Today, they reckon there's about 55,000 churches. The growth and the impact of the gospel. South Korea, in the 1900s, Christianity was minimal. They now reckon 17% of the country are believers in the Lord Jesus. That's just in the last 100 odd years. Um, Iran reckons in 1979 there was about 500 believers 
There's now, they reckon, over 100,000. And that's in a country where it's very, very difficult to be a Christian. And this one that really encouraged me in China, we've all known the story of China, we've got folk who are connected to China. They reckon there's more Christians in China today than there are in the United States. Such is the growth of the gospel. And if you actually look at the world today, the world, we, reckon that it, we reckon that the population of the world is growing by about 1.5% per annum. And the experts, and I'm not one of them, but the experts tell me that Christianity is growing at the rate of 3.5% per annum. So it's growing more than the population of the world. And that's quite encouraging as well. And I just was reminded as I looked at these stats, it started with 11 men, as they were commended and asked, commissioned to go and preach the gospel to Jerusalem, to Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. And again, I'm not trying to guilt anyone, but the challenge to you and I, to our generation, is how do we respond to that? First of all, I would encourage us to pray, and we've got, obviously, the magazines. Um, just another reminder for you, you can still order if you haven't. Uh, if you're Scottish or Irish, you'll like a deal. And if you order them before the 15th of November, you get them a little bit cheaper. So uh, we would encourage you, if you haven't placed your order, to go ahead and do that. And if you've never ordered the magazine, if you've never ever subscribed to Equus International, uh, you can do that. And if you do that for the first year, it's free. And we're doing that purposely to encourage folks to be more involved and hear more of what God is doing across the world. And more importantly, and I love when I meet folk like this, every so often I come across somebody who has the magazine and they're praying for a mission every day. It's part of their routine. And they know all about what God is doing because they actually are praying actively for mission in our day and in our generation. Just also to remind you, we talked about Tilsley. Ben mentioned that. I'm not going to mention First Serve. He's done a better job than I have. But we're also helping people to equip better by sending them to Tilsley College. We're happy to try and identify individuals who think that God has had a call on their life and we're happy to try and equip them as well. So we would encourage that as well. And finally, I know my time is away, um, we're going to encourage you to try and... Uh, buy the book if you have not already done that because it is a real encouragement as you read through the pages and just read of what God has done in 19 uh, in the 100 year anniversary um, the editors and trustees decided to publish a very academic an excellent book called They Turned the World Upside Down it was a history of what God was done God had done over those 100 years and we decided this time to do something a little bit different in trying to be just recognise the variety of what God is doing. We looked at folk who either are serving at the present moment or people who had served, and we put together this book with 150 pages, 150 stories, 150 messages, what happened over the last 150 years. And we would encourage you to buy that. I asked um, Nathaniel to put the slide together to give me a Christmassy hint. I don't know what I like talking about Christmas in November, but... I'm on a sales drive here. So, um, if you buy two books, we'll get you a third one free, and they're great Christmas presents. You know, forget the, forget the towels this year or the, you know, the stuff you normally buy. Buy a couple of books to really inspire you to see what God has actually done. Um, and I know I'm being a little bit frivolous at the end, but it is good to hear what God is doing and to rejoice in that but for every one of us. And it's not just about young folk, actually. I remember a mission conference where someone at 65 gave up everything and went and served for four or five years. So it's not just about individuals uh, when you're young. Every one of us can serve, but we can also pray and we can get more involved. And that's the encouragement today. Rupert. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm going to... Um give a closing prayer now and uh, give thanks for the offering uh, £1,411.70 was um, taken up uh, during this first session and we've got um, lunch following so um, I'm going to um, pray for that. Heavenly Father we thank you so much for our time this morning 
We thank you for uh, the offering taken up and we pray that you will bless that and use it for the furtherance of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for our fellowship. We thank you for all that you give us and for this food that we're going to share this lunchtime. We ask for your blessing amongst us in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, lunch is straight out of here in Lakeview 1. That's for everyone who's purchased lunch tickets and has registered with either Nicola or Leslie uh, on, on your way in. Um, and if you're not registered in for lunch and need to go and find some, then you'll find some food outlets in the shopping center that is nearby here. The exhibition, which is set um, spread around the foyer area, will be open until 20 past two. Um, and uh, it will be closed down after the um, afternoon session because we have to make a speedy exit to the ferry, at, uh, so have to set down quickly. So just open until 20 past two, and then please also visit the other exhibitors here uh, in the hall over the lunch time. Thank you very much. Hello from Gospel School for the Deaf. In Fiji. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in everything you do. And He will give you success.
My name is Richard Hartnett and I work as the ECHOES International Equipping and Training Manager. I'd just like to tell you about Tilsley College, a ministry of GLOW Europe. The college has been involved in training people for Christian ministry for a number of years and my wife and I both studied there before serving in Peru. The one-year certificate program combines classroom learning with practical experience in various areas, including cross-cultural ministry. It's a great way to deepen your understanding, develop your skills, and see what God might be calling you to. Echoes International has partnered with GLOW and Tilsley College to support several students each year. So if you have an interest in cross-cultural mission, the support of your local church, and feel that a year at Tilsley would help you to explore this, then we'd be keen to talk with you about that. Also, if you are a church leader and feel that one of your members would benefit from the Tilsley Certificate Year as preparation for cross-cultural ministry, whether in the UK or overseas, then please contact us. The time that my wife and I spent at Tilsley certainly gave us a good foundation for the subsequent years we spent in Peru. And if you feel this experience would be a good next step for you or for someone that you know in your church, then please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Auziți sirenile de culcare. De culcare. Dear friends, greetings from Kiev. Today is 17th of May and we are packing our minibuses to take a long trip to East Ukraine, Donetsk, Lugansk provinces, Slavyansk city, Kramatorsk. Here our friends, volunteers, pastors, which will travel together far away from Kiev. Three days, three. Thank you all of you to all of you who has been helping us to have all this really important provision which we will bring with us to front line. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your love, your help, your support. Greetings from all of us. God bless you. Dear Petr Hus, here is Fyodor, you know maybe him, but you don't know me, you know, our brothers, volunteers, pastors, and we reach destination. This is all help from you, from your brothers and sisters in Czech Republic and Czech Republic and Slovakia. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. So we are in Slavyansk in East Ukraine and delivering all provision here. To brothers and sisters in the several buses four buses came here so thank you friends for your love your prayer and your care about us god bless you friends Dear friends, we are on the way to Liman city. Russians just a few days ago left it 
those towns, cities where we now, and you see exploded all bridges. So we try with our chaplains and the military uh, escort to come through. Here's our buses. So many killed people. Destructions is horrible. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just put. Well. Yes. Come. And we, because we will bring necessary help to to Liman. Nobody uh, of other organizations are have possibility, opportunity to come there. Mm -hmm. Then we have third car. So, da, 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 good, good. This is where we are. И тебе такое же дают, а ты когда Да, да, да. Давай. Я на тот тот другой не знаю. Да, это много. Так, а это на дети? Нет, это и. Тоже вам? Это все вам. Да, и сейчас, смотрите, смотрите, это мивина. Just been encouraged by uh, just the teaching that we receive on faith, and um, just encouraged that it's uh, step by step that we can live a life of faith. And uh, it seems I think that's been a really encouraging thing that we've learned this weekend. Well, I've really enjoyed being at Wider Horizons. Baskerley House is beautiful. It's been great to be with a good group of young people who all have an interest in mission. It's been a fun, informal time. Um, and I've really enjoyed the praise times and I've especially enjoyed having those opportunities for one-on-one -on -one, um, with young people talking about their lives, where they're at and possible next steps for them. So I've enjoyed learning about um, the different work that missionaries do abroad and how they bring their own individual skills to the table and um, how they serve Jesus in that way. I've enjoyed getting to meet lots of new Christians from different backgrounds and some from different cultures and learning more about their faith. Yeah, I've really enjoyed from this weekend just being able to ask a lot of questions of people who have so much experience in the field of mission and really being inspired by that and encouraged.
I definitely wasn't expecting to learn as much as I did at Tilsley and it was, it was amazing. I was pushed beyond my comfort zone and the Lord was really faithful to be walking closely with me at this time. Thank you to First Serve for being able to give me this opportunity to be able to sort of strengthen my faith and being able to equip myself so I can hopefully spread the gospel even further in the future. Welcome to our uh, exhibition, our 150th exhibition for Echoes International. As you start to walk through this, uh, a couple of things to bring out from it. First of all, it primarily isn't a history lesson, although there's a lot of history within the exhibition itself, so that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing, um, it's, it's not um, a celebration of Echoes. It's a celebration of what God has done and is doing across the world. Echo International uh, came together in 2016, but it's actually 150 years old. Echoes of Service started in 1872, and basically there were two reasons for it coming together. The first reason was sending money from the UK church um, to missionaries abroad. Um, and 150 years ago, sending money was quite difficult. We were so used to apps and stuff where you just put the money in and send it. That was a tough gig 150 years ago, so there was a need for that kind of service. There still is actually, and we'll pick up on that later on. Um, and the second reason was to encourage the folks at home as to what God has been doing over the last 150 years. Uh, and it was infectious. You know, over the last 150 years, more than 6,200 Men and women have left these shores and have gone to various countries across the world and actually has changed the world. If you look at places like South America, the South of Africa, parts of Asia, God has done remarkable things through men and women just giving him everything and following him. And really, as we take you through the presentation, there's certainly something to give, thought, give thanks to God for from that perspective. But the second thing is to remind people, the job isn't done yet. There's still a task to finish. And we'll pick up some of the stuff as we walk through the exhibition over the next 20 minutes or so. The first thing to pick up is, as you start to look at the slides, you'll start to see headings. And the reason we've put those headings together is to let you see what the need of the world is today. And even though some of the things we talk about and pick up a historical, these needs are still current and we'll bring that to the fore as we walk through uh, the exhibition uh, together. The first thing is, uh, and this is a need which is current today, is the need of cities and urbanisation. Over the next 30-40 years, 
they reckon, the, st the statisticians reckon, that 80% of the world is going to live in a city. And so there's a real opportunity evangelically to reach men and women through mission in cities. Um, now, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. When missionaries went to places like Africa and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, they, st they tended to start at the outsides and then walk in towards the center. Um, and there's an obvious reason for that because they tended to land in boats or ships uh, and they landed at the coast and then started to evangelize inwards. But the world has changed. And as a result of most of us living in cities, there's a real opportunity where, and if you think about it, cities are great places where many people come together. Uh, and we'll talk about the unreached people uh, in a few minutes later. But they're in the city. And if you're thinking, well, God's done this before, well, you're well, absolutely right, he has. If you think of Jerusalem, when the gospel was first preached, they started in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a real opportunity when people take the gospel to an urban scene, a city, and through that work, the gospel starts to spread. And that, that need exists today across the world's cities, uh, in particular in the areas that are unreached as well. The second area is thinking of Bible teaching. One of the criticisms of uh, other areas sometimes, particularly in Africa, people will say that the church is a mile wide and only an inch thick. I don't think that's a very fair criticism, actually. I think it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. But you could actually say that's the same for the UK as well. But there is a need for gifted Bible teachers to be able to encourage, to be able to challenge uh, and that's still a need today as well across most of the church, uh, whether it's in the UK or in Europe as well. So that's a need that we would start to recognise as well. One of the other areas that's becoming quite exciting actually is the world of social media and the internet and the ability to reach people that you would never be able to get to reach normally. Uh, and there's some examples there of radio work and all the stuff that goes on with printing, etc. But actually, in today's society, in the world we live today, there's a real opportunity to be able to reach people sitting in the UK in other parts of the world. We have mission partners on our list, and they are working in the UK, but actually they're having an outreach in China. There's a couple um, who we know, they're not on our list, but they work in the Middle East, and husband and wife on Facebook and they've got something like 140,000 followers across places like Syria and Sudan and Egypt, places that most people would find it very difficult to go to in terms of mission. And so if there are folk who are listening to this, folk who go round about the exhibition and you've got a skill, social media, computing, digital, there's opportunities for people to serve today to reach people across the world. The other thing that's um, happening, and it's happened all through uh, society, is the movement of people. And it's a very relevant thing to today when you bear in mind what's happening in Ukraine. There are peoples who are moving all sorts of different places, and there's an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. There's, um, there was a movement in Germany, I'm not sure what it is now, but there was a movement in Germany where thousands of Afghans were coming to Christ because they had migrated to the country a number of years ago and they would talk about actually being allowed at some point to go back to Afghanistan and to take the gospel. God is bringing people who are difficult to reach at the present moment to the shores of Europe and there's an opportunity to serve amongst those uh, peoples as well in order to take the gospel. And God of course did that as I said earlier on, the movement of people when you think of the the historical church, where it started in Jerusalem and it spread throughout the then known world. Um, God is still doing that and that opportunity is still there today as well. One of the biggest um, opportunities in terms of serving and mission is what we would term the unreached people's group. They reckon about 42% of the world don't know the gospel, never heard the gospel. 42% of the world have little access to Christianity or even a Bible. Um, they reckon one in five 
across the whole of the world don't have a Bible in their own language. And there's a real opportunity again to just think about um, the unreached people groups across the world, people groups that are difficult to get a hold of, difficult to access. And we'll talk more uh, later on in the exhibition about different models of mission as well, and being able to see um, how we can access some of these groups that are very difficult to get into because either political problems or another religion or just um, geopolitical issues uh, take Ukraine again uh, as a good example. And so one of the key things that we are trying to bring across as Equus International is the need for people to have a desire to serve in places where the gospel hasn't reached yet. God has done amazing things over the last 150 years. And if you think of um, those who have gone from the UK and then add to that um, the US and Canada and New Zealand and also um, Australia, uh, God has remarkably changed the world. Christianity is on the march. He's continuing to build his church. But there is a danger sometimes in the UK, we kind of think the job's done and it's not. Um, it's a very kind of Western view of things rather than seeing mission happening across the whole of the world. It used to be um, the Western countries would send missionaries. Missionaries are now moving across the whole of the world from all sorts of different countries. Places that are now sending missionaries where some of our missionaries have actually gone. One of the biggest sending countries is South Korea, for instance. Uh, and so God is starting to do things across the whole of the world rather than just what happens from the UK uh, or the West. But the job or the task is still unfinished and it'd be important that we bring that out as we start to walk through the exhibition. But in the unreached areas, and just follow me, in the unreached areas, there's other opportunities to serve with what we would call different models of mission. Um, most people, when you talk about mission or the word missionary, will have a kind of image in their head. I, I kind of think of the black and white with the guys with hats, um, the David Livingston of this world, the Fred Stanley Arnott's. And that model of mission is still relevant to vast parts of the world. But there are different ways to do mission as well. And um, it would be important to think of, we've called it different or creative models of mission, but things like bivocationalism. So volunteering and using your professional skills in a mission context. Um, there's a couple of doctors we know who have structured their career so that they've got about 10 weeks a year where they can serve in mission. And so they can go to different hospitals, different parts of the world, and they can bring their skills to upskill and equip the indigenous people in that nation. The other thing to think about is also actually going and working in some of these countries. There are lots of hard to reach countries who wouldn't let a missionary across the border but they wouldn't let someone with a professional skill to come and help them build whatever that country is. Uh, and there's, there are agencies, almost like employment agencies, and they're really set up to make sure that jobs that can be done by believers from the UK or the US, and they can move to these countries and serve there as well. The other opportunity is actually starting a business in some of these countries where you can have a legitimacy to be there as far as your visa and work permit is concerned. But really your reason for being there is to bring the gospel to folk who don't actually hear the gospel and don't know who the Lord Jesus is. So that's another area where people can serve and it's a huge opportunity in uh, mission circumstances at the present, more, present moment. The other thing that's very relevant is actually cross-cultural work in the UK. There are lots of different ethnic minorities and migrant people in the UK at the present moment, and there's an opportunity to serve them. And if you take any of the typical cities across the UK and think of areas where you could serve, I think most churches would know of a community where they could go and witness. And over um, the last two or three years in particular, there are a number of couples who have cross-cultural skills They've either served in another country or they speak the same language as the group nearby them 
and they're able to witness and serve and we would support some of those couples as well and so if you have an opportunity where people are um, an ethnic minority living in your community there's an opportunity to go and speak to them and serve and preach the gospel and bring the Lord Jesus Christ to them as well there are other areas that echoes pick up um, disaster relief again is very relevant at the present moment uh, often we will send sums of money where uh, there is need across the world Ukraine's an obvious example of that at the present moment and we're working with various charities to help take money that's come from churches and also from Echoes International as well and using that in the refugee crisis. That's something that happens all the time at Echoes, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine, um, the tsunami in Asia uh, a few years ago. There's numbers of opportunities where we can actually help uh, to serve and also help to help with aid in that situation as well. And of course, there's also the persecuted church and highlighting the needs of the persecuted church. They tend to be linked to those areas that we would term as unreached as well. It's very interesting. Um, often when you're in a prayer meeting in the UK and someone prays with the persecuted church, they will pray for the persecution to stop. Well, if you are in some of these countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, places like that, the Christians there don't pray for the persecution to stop. They pray for opportunities to preach the gospel. They pray for opportunities to take the gospel to these communities. Um, I'm always reminded of the, the first prayer meeting after the disciples were persecuted at Jerusalem. And if you look at the prayer that they made, they didn't pray for the persecution to end, but they prayed that they might have boldness as they spoke and preached the gospel. And in many of these countries uh, where there is persecution, in fact, probably Christianity is the most persecuted religion, actually. Um, things don't change, but there's an opportunity to, 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 to fellowship with some of these saints through the work of Echoes International as well. Um, there's lots of historical memorabilia that sits and kind of gives you an understanding of how Echoes of Service communicated over the years. Uh, and so there's a prayer telephone, there's all sorts of stuff you can pick up and look. So I would recommend uh, that you do that as well. A couple of things just to remind you of. Um, 19, 18, 19, 1972, um, Echo Service published a book called um, They Turned the World Upside Down. And it was a kind of academic, historical look at mission from 1872 all the way through to 1972. And that's what they did to commemorate the 100 years of Echoes of Service. This year we wanted to try and take a different tack. Rather than put together an academic book that almost repeated that book, we decided to put together a book that kind of just gave a summary of some of the amazing things that God is doing. So we, we, we decided to look at um, 150 years of mission with 150 photographs and 150 stories that sits behind that. And this book is the kind of work that was put together. Uh, and uh, there's a real, it's a fantastic book actually. There are lots of different stories of things that have happened, both with current mission partners and also with those that have served uh, over the years. And it's a, it's a superb book just to be able to pick up and just read a story every now and again. And there's, I've got tons of favourites. My favourite, I guess, if I was to ask for one, George Hanlon in China. Um, who was serving uh, for a number of years and was basically arrested. And there was a small assembly that he and his wife were part of. And after being let go, they basically had to leave the country with nothing. And as a result of it being in China, there was very little contact and they had no idea what happened to the church after all these years. And near the end of his life, someone made contact and got hold of him and were able to give him some feedback and what had happened after he left. And there's now an assembly of 300 plus uh, worshiping and meeting and have been doing so since that day. So God took that 30 odd different folk and fellowship and blessed them. So that's a really good example of just one of the stories, one of the 150 stories that are in that book. So we'd recommend that book for you and it's important that you would have a look and think of that as well. And the last thing is um, 
Uh, we put together a, a, a pack for children and for teenagers. Sometimes getting across mission to children is quite difficult, uh, and the team have worked really ha hard to put together um, 12 different lessons. And again, that's something else that can be used as part of um, Bible classes or Sunday schools as well. So I would encourage you to take your time to go through the exhibition, read through some of the material. Um, it's great that you're here. It's great that you've taken the time to do that. And we hope that you are blessed by what you hear, but more importantly, that you're challenged by what you see and get involved in mission in some way. It, I mean, it's very unlikely, I guess, that somebody's going to walk around the exhibition and be challenged to go and serve in another country. But you could be challenged to pray more. You could be challenged to get involved more, whatever that involved looks like. And our prayer is there's just a, a desire in your heart to see the gospel preached, to see mission continuing as we just obey the command of the Lord Jesus to go. Okay, um, one of the other things as you are going through the exhibition, take time to sit and listen to the film that's been put together. Uh, it just captures some of the mission partners who are serving at the present moment and just brings across some of the things that they're doing and also the work that Echoes International does as well. But there's a fantastic bit at the end, and I won't spoil it, but it's from an exhibition in the late 60s with Interlink and the challenge at the end of it is very stirring, but take time to just sit for 15 minutes or so after you've gone through the exhibition and just have a look at the film as well. Thank you. We've got a fantastic story to tell. We've got a wonderful heritage. I really hope that in our 150th anniversary year, we can inspire people with all these stories of dedication and sacrifice and committed lives. Just the process of getting here, uh, being on mission, uh, was just perfect timing uh, with God and how He provided. It's a beautiful thing to serve the Lord. 6,200 mission partners to over 130 different countries. Look what God has done with that <laughs> over these 150 years. Welcome to our uh, exhibition, our 150th exhibition for Echoes International. As you start to walk through this, uh, a couple of things to bring out from it. First of all, it primarily isn't a history lesson, although there's a lot of history within the exhibition itself, so that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing, um, it's, it's not um, a celebration of Echoes. It's a celebration of what God has done and is doing across the world. Exit International uh, came together in 2016, but it's actually 150 years old. Echoes of Service started in 1872, and basically there were two reasons for it coming together. The first reason was sending money from the UK church um, to missionaries abroad. Um, and 150 years ago, sending money was quite difficult. We were so used to apps and stuff where you just put the money in and send it. That was a tough gig 150 years ago, so there was a need for that kind of service. There still is actually, and we'll pick up on that later on. Um, and the second reason was to encourage the folks at home as to what God has been doing over the last 150 years. Uh, and it was infectious. You know, over the last 150 years, more than 6,200 men and women have left these shores and have gone to various countries across the world and actually has changed the world. If you look at places like South America, the South of Africa, parts of Asia, God has done remarkable things through men and women just giving him everything and following him. And really, as we take you through the presentation, there's certainly something to give, thought, give thanks to God for from that perspective. But the second thing is to remind people, the job isn't done yet. There's still a task to finish. And we'll pick up some of the stuff as we walk through the exhibition over the next 20 minutes or so. 
The first thing to pick up is, as you start to look at the slides, you'll start to see headings. And the reason we've put those headings together is to let you see what the need of the world is today. And even though some of the things we talk about and pick up are historical, these needs are still current. And we'll bring that to the fore as we walk through uh, the exhibition uh, together. The first thing is, uh, and this is a need which is current today, is the need of cities and urbanisation. Over the next 30, 40 years, they reckon, the, st the statisticians reckon, that 80% of the world is going to live in a city. And so there's a real opportunity, evangelically, to reach men and women through mission in cities. Um, now, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. When missionaries went to places like Africa and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, they, st they tended to start at the outsides and then walk in towards the centre. Um, and there's an obvious reason for that, because they tended to land in boats or ships, uh, and they landed at the coast and then started to evangelise inwards. But the world has changed. And as a result of most of us living in cities, there's a real opportunity where, and if you think about it, cities are great places where many people come together. Uh, and we'll talk about the unreached people uh, in a few minutes later. But they're in the city. And if you're thinking, well, God's done this before, well, you're absolutely right, he has. If you think of Jerusalem, when the gospel was first preached, they started in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a real opportunity when people take the gospel to an urban scene, a city, and through that work, the gospel starts to spread. And that, that need exists today across the world's cities, uh, in particular in the areas that are unreached as well. The second area is thinking of Bible teaching. One of the criticisms of uh, other areas sometimes, particularly in Africa, people will say that the church is a mile wide and only an inch thick. I don't think that's a very fair criticism, actually. I think it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. But you could actually say that's the same for the UK as well. But there is a need for gifted Bible teachers to be able to encourage, to be able to challenge uh, and that's still a need today as well across most of the church, um, whether it's in the UK or in Europe as well. So that's a need that we would start to recognise as well. One of the other areas that's becoming quite exciting actually is the world of social media and the internet and the ability to reach people that you would never be able to get to reach normally. Uh, and there's some examples there of radio work and all the stuff that goes on with printing, etc. But actually, in today's society, in the world we live today, there's a real opportunity to be able to reach people sitting in the UK in other parts of the world. We have mission partners on our list, and they are working in the UK, but actually they're having an outreach in China. There's a couple um, who we know, they're not on our list, but they work in the Middle East, and husband and wife on Facebook and they've got something like 140,000 followers across places like Syria and Sudan and Egypt, places that most people would find it very difficult to go to in terms of mission. And so if there are folk who are listening to this, folk who go round about the exhibition and you've got a skill, social media, computing, digital, there's opportunities for people to serve today to reach people across the world. The other thing that's um, happening, and it's happened all through uh, society, is the movement of people. And it's a very relevant thing to today when you bear in mind what's happening in Ukraine. There are peoples who are moving all sorts of different places, and there's an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. There's um, the money from the UK church um, to missionaries abroad. Um, and 150 years ago, sending money was quite difficult. We were so used to apps and stuff where you just put the money in and send it. That was a tough gig 150 years ago. So there was a need for that kind of service. There still is actually, and we'll pick up on that later on. Um, 
And the second reason was to encourage the folks at home as to what God has been doing over the last 150 years. Uh, and it was infectious. You know, over the last 150 years, more than 6,200 men and women have left these shores and have gone to various countries across the world and actually has changed the world. If you look at places like South America, the South of Africa, parts of Asia, God has done remarkable things through men and women just giving him everything uh, and following him. And really, as we take you through the presentation, there's certainly something to give, thought, give thanks to God for from that perspective. But the second thing is to remind people, the job isn't done yet. There's still a task to finish. And we'll pick up some of the stuff as we walk through the exhibition over the next 20 minutes or so. The first thing to pick up is, as you start to look at the slides, you'll start to see headings. And the reason we've put those headings together is to let you see what the need of the world is today. And even though some of the things we talk about and pick up are historical, these needs are still current. And we'll bring that to the fore as we walk through uh, the exhibition uh, together. The first thing is, uh, and this is a need which is current today, is the need of cities and urbanisation. Over the next 30, 40 years, they reckon, the, st the statisticians reckon, that 80% of the world is going to live in a city. And so there's a real opportunity, evangelically, to reach men and women through mission in cities. Um, now, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. When missionaries went to places like Africa and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, they, st they tended to start at the outsides and then walk in towards the center. Um, and there's an obvious reason for that because they tended to land in boats or ships uh, and they landed at the coast and then started to evangelize inwards. But the world has changed. And as a result of most of us living in cities, there's a real opportunity where, and if you think about it, cities are great places where many people come together. Uh, and we'll talk about the unreached people uh, in a few minutes later. But they're in the city. And if you're thinking, well, God's done this before, well, you're absolutely right, he has. If you think of Jerusalem, when the gospel was first preached, they started in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a real opportunity when people take the gospel to an urban scene, a city, and through that work, the gospel starts to spread. And that, that need exists today across the world's cities, uh, in particular in the areas that are unreached as well. The second area is thinking of Bible teaching. One of the criticisms of uh, other areas sometimes, particularly in Africa, people will say that the church is a mile wide and only an inch thick. I don't think that's a very fair criticism, actually. I think it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. But you could actually say that's the same for the UK as well. But there is a need for gifted Bible teachers to be able to encourage, to be able to challenge. Uh, and that's still a need today as well across most of the church, uh, whether it's in the UK or in Europe as well. So that's a need that we would start to recognise as well. One of the other areas that's becoming quite exciting actually is the world of social media and the internet and the ability to reach people that you would never be able to get to reach normally. Uh, and there's some examples there of radio work and all the stuff that goes on with printing, etc. But actually in today's society and the world we live today, there's a real opportunity to be able to reach people sitting in the UK in other parts of the world. We have mission partners on our list and they are working in the UK, but actually they're having an outreach in China. There's a couple um, who we know, they're not on our list, but they work in the Middle East and husband and wife on Facebook and they've got something like 140,000 followers across places like Syria and Sudan and Egypt, places that most people would find it very difficult to go to in terms of mission. And so if there are folk who are listening to this, folk who go round about the exhibition and you've got a skill, social media, computing, digital, there's opportunities for people to serve today to reach people across the world. 
The other thing that's um, happening, and it's happened all through uh, society, is the movement of people. And it's a very relevant thing to today when you bear in mind what's happening in Ukraine. There are peoples who are moving all sorts of different places, and there's an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. There's, um, there was a movement in Germany, I'm not sure what it is now, but there was a movement in Germany where thousands of Afghans were coming to Christ because they had migrated to the country a number of years ago. And they would talk about actually being allowed at some point to go back to Afghanistan and to take the gospel. God is bringing people who are difficult to reach at the present moment to the shores of Europe. And there's an opportunity to serve amongst those uh, peoples as well in order to take the gospel. And God, of course, did that, as I said earlier on, the movement of people, when you think of the the historical church, where it started in Jerusalem and it spread throughout the then known world. Um, God is still doing that and that opportunity is still there today as well. One of the biggest um, opportunities in terms of serving in mission is what we would term the unreached people's group. They reckon about 42% of the world don't know the gospel, never heard the gospel. 42% of the world have little access to Christianity or even a Bible. Um, they reckon one in five across the whole of the world don't have a Bible in their own language. And there's a real opportunity again to just think about um, the unreached people groups across the world. People groups that are difficult to get a hold of, difficult to access. And we'll talk more uh, later on in the exhibition about different models of mission as well. And being able to see um, how we can access some of these groups that are very difficult to get into because either political problems or another religion or just um, geopolitical issues. Uh, take Ukraine again uh, as a good example. And so one of the key things that we are trying to bring across as Equus International is the need for people to have a desire to serve in places where the gospel hasn't reached yet. God has done amazing things over the last 150 years. And if you think of um, those who have gone from the UK and then add to that um, the US and Canada and New Zealand and also um, Australia, uh, God has remarkably changed the world. Christianity is on the march. He's continuing to build his church. But there is a danger sometimes in the UK we kind of think the job's done and it's not. Um, it's a very kind of Western view of things rather than seeing mission happening across the whole of the world. It used to be um, the Western countries would send missionaries. Missionaries are now moving across the whole of the world from all sorts of different countries. Places that are now sending missionaries where some of their missionaries have actually gone. One of the biggest sending countries is South Korea, for instance. Uh, and so God is starting to do things across the whole of the world rather than just what happens from the UK or the West. But the job or the task is still unfinished and it'd be important that we bring that out as we start to walk through the exhibition. But in the unreached areas, and just follow me, in the unreached areas, there's other opportunities to serve with what we would call different models of mission. Um, most people, when you talk about mission or the word missionary, will have a kind of image in their head. I kind of think of the black and white with the guys with hats. Um, the David Livingston of this world, the Fred Stanley Arnott's. And that model of mission is still relevant to vast parts of the world. But there are different ways to do mission as well. And um, it would be important to think of, we've called it different or creative models of mission. But things like bivocationalism. So volunteering and using your professional skills in a mission context. Um, there's a couple of doctors we know who have structured their career so that they've got about 10 weeks a year where they can serve in mission. And so they can go to different hospitals, different parts of the world, and they can bring their skills to upskill and equip the indigenous people in that nation. The other thing to think about is also actually going and working in some of these countries. There are lots of hard-to-reach countries who wouldn't let a missionary across the border, 
but they wouldn't let someone with a professional skill to come and help them build whatever that country is. Uh, and there's, there are agencies, almost like employment agencies, and they're really set up to make sure that jobs that can be done by believers from the UK or the US, and they can move to these countries and serve there as well. The other opportunity is actually starting a business in some of these countries where you can have a legitimacy to be there as far as your visa and work permit is concerned. But really your reason for being there is to bring the gospel to folk who don't actually hear the gospel and don't know who the Lord Jesus is. So that's another area where people can serve and it's a huge opportunity in uh, mission circumstances at the present, mo present moment. The other thing that's very relevant is actually cross-cultural work in the UK. There are lots of different ethnic minorities and migrant people in the UK at the present moment, and there's an opportunity to serve them. And if you take any of the typical cities across the UK and think of areas where you could serve, I think most churches would know of a community where they could go and witness. And over um, the last two or three years in particular, there are a number of couples who have cross-cultural skills They've either served in another country or they speak the same language as the group nearby them and they're able to witness and serve and we would support some of those couples as well. And so if you have an opportunity where people are um, an ethnic minority living in your community, there's an opportunity to go and speak to them and serve and preach the gospel and bring the Lord Jesus Christ to them as well. There are other areas that Echoes pick up, um, disaster relief, Again, it's very relevant at the present moment. Uh, often we will send sums of money where uh, there is need across the world. Ukraine's an obvious example of that at the present moment. And we're working with various charities to help take money that's come from churches and also from Equus International as well and using that in the refugee crisis. That's something that happens all the time at Echoes, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine. Um, the tsunami in Asia uh, a few years ago, there's numbers of opportunities where we can actually help uh, to serve and also help to help with aid in that situation as well. And of course, there's also the persecuted church and highlighting the needs of the persecuted church. They tend to be linked to those areas that we would term as unreached as well. It's very interesting. Um, often when you're in a prayer meeting in the UK and someone prays with the persecuted church, they will pray for the persecution to stop. Well, if you are in some of these countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, places like that, the Christians there don't pray for the persecution to stop. They pray for opportunities to preach the gospel. They pray for opportunities to take the gospel to these communities. Um, I'm always reminded of the, the first prayer meeting after the disciples were persecuted at Jerusalem. And if you look at the prayer that they made, they didn't pray for the persecution to end, but they prayed that they might have boldness as they spoke and preached the gospel. And in many of these countries uh, where there is persecution, in fact, probably Christianity is the most persecuted religion, actually. Um, things don't change, but there's an opportunity to, 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 to fellowship with some of these saints through the work of Equus International as well. And um, there's lots of historical memorabilia that sits and kind of gives you an understanding of how Echoes of Service communicated over the years. Uh, and so there's a prayer telephone, there's all sorts of stuff you can pick up and look. So I would recommend uh, that you do that as well. A couple of things just to remind you of. Um, 19, 18, 19, 1972, um, Echoes of Service published a book called um, They Turned the World Upside Down. And it was a kind of academic, historical look at mission from 1872 all the way through to 1972. And that's what they did to commemorate the 100 years of Echoes of Service. This year we wanted to try and take a different tack. Rather than put together an academic book that almost repeated that book, we decided to put together a book that kind of just gave a summary of some of the amazing things that God is doing so we, we, we decided to look at um, 150 years of mission. 
with 150 photographs and 150 stories that sits behind that. And this book is the kind of work that was put together. Uh, and uh, there's a real, it's a fantastic book actually, with lots of different stories of things that have happened, both with current mission partners and also with those that have served uh, over the years. And it's a, it's a superb book just to be able to pick up and just read a story every now and again. And there's, I've got tons of favourites. My favourite, I guess, if I was to ask for one, George Hanlon in China, um, who was serving uh, for a number of years and was basically arrested. And there was a small assembly that he and his wife were part of. And after being let go, they basically had to leave the country with nothing. And as a result of it being in China, there was very little contact, and they had no idea what happened to the church after all these years. And nearer the end of his life, someone made contact and got hold of him and were able to give him some feedback on what had happened after he left. And there's now an assembly of 300 plus uh, worshiping and meeting and have been doing so since that day. So God took that 30 odd different folk and fellowship and blessed them. So that's a really good example of just one of the stories, one of the 150 stories that are in that book. So we'd recommend that book for you and it's important that you would have a look and think of that as well. And the last thing is um, uh, we put together a, a, a pack for children and for teenagers. Sometimes getting across mission to children is quite difficult. Uh, and the team have worked really her hard to put together um, 12 different lessons. And again, that's something else that can be used as part of um, Bible classes or Sunday schools as well. So I would encourage you to take your time to go through the exhibition, read through some of the material. Um, it's great that you're here. It's great that you've taken the time to do that. And we hope that you are blessed by what you hear, but more importantly, that you're challenged by what you see and get involved in mission in some way. It, I mean, it's very unlikely, I guess, that somebody's going to walk around the exhibition and be challenged to go and serve in another country. But you could be challenged to pray more you could be challenged to get involved more, whatever that involved looks like. And our prayer is there's just a, a desire in your heart to see the gospel preached, to see mission continuing as we just obey the command of the Lord Jesus to go. Okay, um, one of the other things as you are going through the exhibition, take time to sit and listen to the film that's been put together. Uh, it just captures some of the mission partners who are serving at the present moment and just brings across some of the things that they're doing and also the work that Echoes International does as well. But there's a fantastic bit at the end, and I won't spoil it, but it's from an exhibition in the late 60s with Interlink and the challenge at the end of it is very stirring. But take time to just sit for 15 minutes or so after you've gone through the exhibition and just have a look at the film as well. Thank you. We've got a fantastic story to tell. We've got a wonderful heritage. I really hope that in our 150th anniversary year we can inspire people with all these stories of dedication and sacrifice and committed lives. Just the process of getting here, uh, being on mission, uh, was just perfect timing. Uh, with God and how He provided. It's a beautiful thing to serve the Lord. 6,200 mission partners to over 130 different countries. Look what God has done with that <laughs> over these 150 years. Welcome to our uh, exhibition, our 150th exhibition for Echoes International. As you start to walk through this, uh, a couple of things to bring out from it. First of all, it primarily isn't a history lesson, although there's a lot of history within the exhibition itself, so that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing, um, it's, it's not um, a celebration of Echoes. It's a celebration of what God has done and is doing across the world. 
Exit International uh, came together in 2016, but it's actually 150 years old. Echoes of Service started in 1872. And basically, there were two reasons for it coming together. The first reason was sending money from the UK church um, to missionaries abroad. Um, and 150 years ago, sending money was quite difficult. We were so used to apps and stuff where you just put the money in and send it. That was a tough gig 150 years ago. So there was a need for that kind of service. There still is actually, and we'll pick up on that later on. Um, and the second reason was to encourage the folks at home as to what God has been doing over the last 150 years. Uh, and it was infectious. You know, over the last 150 years, more than 6,200 men and women have left these shores and have gone to various countries across the world and actually has changed the world. If you look at places like South America, the South of Africa, parts of Asia, God has done remarkable things through men and women just giving him everything and following him. And really, as we take you through the presentation, there's certainly something to give, thought, give thanks to God for from that perspective. But the second thing is to remind people the job isn't done yet. There's still a task to finish. And we'll pick up some of the stuff as we walk through the exhibition over the next 20 minutes or so. The first thing to pick up is, as you start to look at the slides, you'll start to see headings. And the reason we've put those headings together is to let you see what the need of the world is today. And even though some of the things we talk about and pick up are historical, these needs are still current. And we'll bring that to the fore as we walk through uh, the exhibition uh, together. The first thing is, uh, and this is a need which is current today, is the need of cities and urbanisation. Over the next 30, 40 years, they reckon, the, st the statisticians reckon, that 80% of the world is going to live in a city. And so there's a real opportunity evangelically to reach men and women through mission in cities. Um, now, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. When missionaries went to places like Africa and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, they, st they tended to start at the outsides and then walk in towards the center. Um, and there's an obvious reason for that because they tended to land in boats or ships uh, and they landed at the coast and then started to evangelize inwards. But the world has changed. And as a result of most of us living in cities, there's a real opportunity where, and if you think about it, cities are great places where many people come together. Uh, and we'll talk about the unreached people uh, in a few minutes later, but they're in the city. And if you're thinking, well, God's done this before, well, you're well, absolutely right, he has. If you think of Jerusalem, when the gospel was first preached, they started in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a real opportunity when people take the gospel to an urban scene, a city, and through that work, the gospel starts to spread. And that, that need exists today across the world's cities, uh, in particular in the areas that are unreached as well. The second area is thinking of Bible teaching. One of the criticisms of uh, other areas sometimes, particularly in Africa, people will say that the church is a mile wide and only an inch thick. I don't think that's a very fair criticism, actually. I think it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. But you could actually say that's the same for the UK as well. But there is a need for gifted Bible teachers to be able to encourage, to be able to challenge. Uh, and that's still a need today as well across most of the church. Um, whether it's in the UK or in Europe as well. So that's a need that we would start to recognise as well. One of the other areas that's becoming quite exciting actually is the world of social media and the internet and the ability to reach people that you would never be able to get to reach normally. Uh, and there's some examples there of radio work and all the stuff that goes on with printing, etc., but actually, in today's society, in the world we live today, there's a real opportunity to be able to reach people sitting in the UK in other parts of the world. We have mission partners on our list, and they are working in the UK, 
but actually they're having an outreach in China. There's a couple um, who we know, they're not on our list, but they work in the Middle East, and husband and wife on Facebook, and they've got something like 140,000 followers across places like Syria and Sudan and Egypt, places that most people would find it very difficult to go to in terms of mission. And so if there are folk who are listening to this, folk who go round about the exhibition, and you've got a skill, social media, computing, digital, there's opportunities for people to serve today to reach people across the world. The other thing that's um, happening, and it's happened all through uh, society, is the movement of people. And it's a very relevant thing to today when you bear in mind what's happening in Ukraine. There are peoples who are moving all sorts of different places. And there's an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. There's, um, there was a movement in Germany, I'm not sure what it is now, but there was a movement in Germany where thousands of Afghans were coming to Christ because they had migrated to the country a number of years ago. And they would talk about actually being allowed at some point to go back to Afghanistan and to take the gospel. God is bringing people who are difficult to reach at the present moment to the shores of Europe. And there's an opportunity to serve amongst those uh, peoples as well in order to take the gospel. And God, of course, did that, as I said earlier on, the movement of people, when you think of the, the historical church, where it started in Jerusalem and it spread throughout the then known world, um, God is still doing that. And that opportunity is still there today as well. One of the biggest um, opportunities in terms of serving and mission is what we would term the unreached people group. They reckon about 42% of the world don't know the gospel, never heard the gospel. 42% of the world have little access to Christianity or even a Bible. Um, they reckon one in five across the whole of the world don't have a Bible in their own language. And there's a real opportunity again to just think about um, the unreached people groups across the world people groups that are difficult to get a hold of, difficult to access. And we'll talk more uh, later on in the exhibition, but different models of mission as well, and being able to see um, how we can access some of these groups that are very difficult to get into because either political problems or another religion or just um, geopolitical issues. Uh, take Ukraine again uh, as a good example. And so one of the key things that we are trying to bring across as Equus International is the need for people to have a desire to serve in places where the gospel hasn't reached yet. God has done amazing things over the last 150 years. And if you think of um, those who have gone from the UK and then add to that um, the US and Canada and New Zealand and also um, Australia, uh, God has remarkably changed the world. Christianity is on the march. He's continuing to build his church. But there is a danger sometimes in the UK, we kind of think the job's done and it's not. Um, it's a very kind of Western view of things, rather than seeing mission happening across the whole of the world. It used to be um, the Western countries would send missionaries. Missionaries are now moving across the whole of the world from all sorts of different countries. Places that are now sending missionaries where some of our missionaries have actually gone. One of the biggest sending countries is South Korea, for instance. Uh, and so God is starting to do things across the whole of the world rather than just what happens from the UK uh, or the West. But the job or the task is still unfinished and it'd be important that we bring that out as we start to walk through the exhibition. But in the unreached areas, and just follow me, in the unreached areas, there's other opportunities to serve with what we would call different models of mission. Um, most people, when you talk about mission or the word missionary, will have a kind of image in their head. I, I kind of think of the black and white with the guys with hats, um, the David Livingston of this world, the Fred Stanley Arnott's. And that model of mission is still relevant to vast parts of the world. But there are different ways to do mission as well. And um, it would be important to think of, we've called it different or creative models of mission, but things like bivocationalism, 
So volunteering and using your professional skills in a mission context. Um, there's a couple of doctors we know who have structured their career so that they've got about 10 weeks a year where they can serve in mission. And so they can go to different hospitals, different parts of the world, and they can bring their skills to upskill and equip the indigenous people in that nation. The other thing to think about is also actually going and working in some of these countries. There are lots of hard to reach countries who wouldn't let a missionary across the border, but they wouldn't let someone with a professional skill to come and help them build whatever that country is. Uh, and there's, there are agencies, almost like employment agencies, and they're really set up to make sure that jobs that can be done by believers from the UK or the US, and they can move to these countries and serve there as well. The other opportunity is actually starting a business in some of these countries, where you can have a legitimacy to be there as far as your visa and work permit is concerned, but really your reason for being there is to bring the gospel to folk who don't actually hear the gospel and don't know who the Lord Jesus is. So that's another area where people can serve, and it's a huge opportunity in uh, mission circumstances at the present, mo present moment. The other thing that's very relevant is actually cross-cultural work in the UK. There are lots of different ethnic minorities and migrant people in the UK at the present moment and there's an opportunity to serve them. And if you take any of the typical cities across the UK and think of areas where you could serve, I think most churches would know of a community where they could go and witness. And over um, the last two, three years in particular, there are a number of couples who have cross-cultural skills. They've either served in another country or they speak the same language as the group nearby them and they're able to witness and serve, and we would support some of those couples as well. And so if you have an opportunity where people are um, an ethnic minority living in your community, there's an opportunity to go and speak to them and serve and preach the gospel and bring the Lord Jesus Christ to them as well. There are other areas that Echoes pick up. Um, disaster relief, again, is very relevant at the present moment. Uh, often we will send sums of money where uh, there is need across the world. Ukraine's an obvious example of that at the present moment. And we're working with various charities to help take money that's come from churches and also from Equus International as well and using that in the refugee crisis. That's something that happens all the time at Echoes, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine. Um, the tsunami in Asia uh, a few years ago. There's numbers of opportunities where we can actually help uh, to serve and also help to help with aid in that situation as well. And of course, there's also the persecuted church and highlighting the needs of the persecuted church. They tend to be linked to those areas that we would term as unreached as well. It's very interesting. Um, often when you're at a prayer meeting in the UK and someone prays with the persecuted church, they will pray for the persecution to stop. Well, if you are in some of these countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, places like that, the Christians there don't pray for the persecution to stop. They pray for opportunities to preach the gospel. They pray for opportunities to take the gospel to these communities. Um, I'm always reminded of the, the first prayer meeting after the disciples were persecuted at Jerusalem. And if you look at the prayer that they made, they didn't pray for the persecution to end but they prayed that they might have boldness as they spoke and preached the gospel. And in many of these countries uh, where there is persecution, in fact, probably Christianity is the most persecuted religion, actually. Um, things don't change, but there's an opportunity to, 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 to fellowship with some of these saints through the work of Equus International as well. Um, there's lots of historical memorabilia that sits and kind of gives you an understanding of how Echoes of Service communicated over the years. Uh, and so there's a prayer telephone, there's all sorts of stuff you can pick up and look. So I would recommend uh, that you do that as well. A couple of things just to remind you of. Um, 19, 18, 19, 1972, um, 
Echo Service published a book called um, They Turned the World Upside Down. And it was a kind of academic, historical look at mission from 1872 all the way through to 1972. And that's what they did to commemorate the 100 years of Echoes of Service. This year we wanted to try and take a different tack. Rather than put together an academic book that almost repeated that book, we decided to put together a book that kind of just gave a summary of some of the amazing things that God is doing. So we, we, we decided to look at um, 150 years of mission with 150 photographs and 150 stories that sits behind that. And this book is the kind of work that was put together. Uh, and uh, there's a real, it's a fantastic book actually, with lots of different stories of things that have happened, both with current mission partners and also with those that have served uh, over the years. And it's a, it's a superb book just to be able to pick up and just read a story every now and again. And there's, I've got tons of favourites. My favourite, I guess, if I was to ask for one, George Hanlon in China. Um, who was serving uh, for a number of years and was basically arrested. And there was a small assembly that he and his wife were part of. And after being let go, they basically had to leave the country with nothing. And as a result of it being in China, there was very little contact and they had no idea what had happened to the church after all these years. And near the end of his life, someone made contact and got a hold of him and were able to give him some feedback and what had happened after he left. And there's now an assembly of 300 plus uh, worshipping and meeting and have been doing so since that day. So God took that 30 odd different folk and fellowship and blessed them. So that's a really good example of just one of the stories, one of the 150 stories that are in that book. So we'd recommend that book for you and it's important that you would have a look and think of that as well. And the last thing is um, uh, we put together a, a, a pack for children and for teenagers. Sometimes getting across mission to children is quite difficult uh, and the team have worked really her hard to put together um, 12 different lessons. And again, that's something else that can be used as part of um, Bible classes or Sunday schools as well. So I would encourage you to take your time to go through the exhibition, read through some of the material. Um, it's great that you're here. It's great that you've taken the time to do that. And we hope that you are blessed by what you hear, but more importantly, that you're challenged by what you see and get involved in mission in some way. It, I mean, it's very unlikely, I guess, that somebody's going to walk around the exhibition and be challenged to go and serve in another country. But you could be challenged to pray more you could be challenged to get involved more, whatever that involved looks like. And our prayer is there's just a, a desire in your heart to see the gospel preached, to see mission continuing as we just obey the command of the Lord Jesus to go. Okay, um, one of the other things as you are going through the exhibition, take time to sit and listen to the film that's been put together. Uh, it just captures some of the mission partners who are serving at the present moment and just brings across some of the things that they're doing and also the work that Echoes International does as well. But there's a fantastic bit at the end, and I won't spoil it, but it's from an exhibition in the late 60s with Interlink and the challenge at the end of it is very stirring. But take time to just sit for 15 minutes or so after you've gone through the exhibition and just have a look at the film as well. Thank you. We've got a fantastic story to tell. We've got a wonderful heritage. I really hope that in our 150th anniversary year we can inspire people with all these stories of dedication and sacrifice and committed lives. Just the process of getting here, uh, being on mission, uh, was just perfect timing. Uh, with God and how He provided. It's a beautiful thing to serve the Lord. 6,200 mission partners to over 130 different countries. Look what God has done with that <laughs> over these 150 years.
Welcome to our uh, exhibition, our 150th exhibition for Echoes International. As you start to walk through this, uh, a couple of things to bring out from it. First of all, it primarily isn't a history lesson, although there's a lot of history within the exhibition itself, so that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing, um, it's, it's not um, a celebration of Echoes. It's a celebration of what God has done and is doing across the world. Echo International uh, came together in 2016, but it's actually 150 years old. Echoes of Service started in 1872, and basically there were two reasons for it coming together. Uh, the first reason was sending money from the UK church um, to missionaries abroad. Um, and 150 years ago, sending money was quite difficult. We were so used to apps and stuff where you just put the money in and send it. That was a tough gig 150 years ago, so there was a need for that kind of service. There still is actually, and we'll pick up on that later on. Um, and the second reason was to encourage the folks at home as to what God has been doing over the last 150 years. Uh, and it was infectious. You know, over the last 150 years, more than 6,200 men and women have left these shores and have gone to various countries across the world and actually has changed the world. If you look at places like South America, the South of Africa, parts of Asia, God has done remarkable things through men and women just giving him everything and following him. And really, as we take you through the presentation, there's certainly something to give, thought, give thanks to God for from that perspective. But the second thing is to remind people, the job isn't done yet. There's still a task to finish. And we'll pick up some of the stuff as we walk through the exhibition over the next 20 minutes or so. The first thing to pick up is, as you start to look at the slides, you'll start to see headings. And the reason we've put those headings together is to let you see what the need of the world is today. And even though some of the things we talk about and pick up are historical, these needs are still current. And we'll bring that to the fore as we walk through uh, the exhibition uh, together. The first thing is, uh, and this is a need which is current today, is the need of cities and urbanisation. Over the next 30, 40 years, they reckon, the, st the statisticians reckon, that 80% of the world is going to live in a city. And so there's a real opportunity evangelically to reach men and women through mission in cities. Um, now, years and years ago, that wasn't the case. When missionaries went to places like Africa and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, they, st they tended to start at the outsides and then walk in towards the center. Um, and there's an obvious reason for that because they tended to land in boats or ships uh, and they landed at the coast and then started to evangelize inwards. But the world has changed. And as a result of most of us living in cities, there's a real opportunity where, and if you think about it, cities are great places where many people come together. Uh, and we'll talk about the unreached people uh, in a few minutes later. But they're in the city. And if you're thinking, well, God's done this before, well, you're well, absolutely right, he has. If you think of Jerusalem, when the gospel was first preached, they started in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a real opportunity when people take the gospel to an urban scene, a city, and through that work, the gospel starts to spread. And that, that need exists today across the world's cities, uh, in particular in the areas that are unreached as well. The second area is thinking of Bible teaching. One of the criticisms of uh, other areas sometimes, particularly in Africa, people will say that the church is a mile wide and only an inch thick. I don't think that's a very fair criticism, actually. I think it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. But you could actually say that's the same for the UK as well. But there is a need for gifted Bible teachers to be able to encourage, to be able to challenge uh, and that's still a need today as well across most of the church, um, whether it's in the UK or in Europe as well. So that's a need that we would start to recognise as well. One of the other areas that's becoming quite exciting actually is 
the world of social media and the internet and the ability to reach people that you would never be able to get to reach normally. Uh, and there's some examples there of radio work and all the stuff that goes on with printing, etc. But actually, in today's society, in the world we live today, there's a real opportunity to be able to reach people sitting in the UK in other parts of the world. We have mission partners on our list and they are working in the UK, but actually they're having an outreach in China. There's a couple um, who we know, they're not on our list, but they work in the Middle
Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for today. We give thanks for what we've heard this morning. And again, we just ask that your word would touch lives, that individuals might respond to the challenge of being involved, whether that's to pray, whether that's to give, whether that's to go. But Father, we just take time to give thanks for what you're doing across the world, for the spread of the gospel, for a message that brings hope to humanity. We think of the needs of this world, and again, we just ask, Father, that you would just help us to pray more uh, and to see you work across all over the globe as a result of the gospel going forward. We pray for our help again this afternoon. We give thanks for this time together, and we offer our praise in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. It's good to have you. Grab a seat, brothers. Take a seat. I'm going to introduce two speakers, one Andy at Hamilton, who you've heard before, and Rames as well. Um, I'll introduce Rames later on. Um, I thought when Andy said that he was from the assembly in Rome, he was going to say it was planted 2,000 years ago, but he never said that. <laughs> it must be another assembly. <laughs> but it's good to have Andy, and it's, we're really grateful that he came back for the conference. I think it's a fleeting visit, is it? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Andy to come up now and talk about more of his work in Rome, and he'll talk about some of the year he's had and some of the things that have happened over the last two or three years as well. So, Andy, over to you. Good. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon. If we were truly Italian, this would be the siesta time. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, feel, feel free, feel free. Um, so I thought uh, for this time in a smaller group uh, this afternoon, it would be useful really just to share um, what has been the most discouraging aspect of ministry over the last year, and also perhaps what has been the most encouraging aspect, uh, especially when you're reporting on some of the, the work that you have the privilege of being involved in. There's always a tendency to talk about all the positive aspects, but the reality is that there are some challenges, some difficulties, and some uh, uh, discouragements. Um, I'm always encouraged by these verses of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. You know the context of Second Timothy as Paul is ending his ministry and as he's tasking uh, Timothy to guard the good deposit, um, he uses these words and he encourages Timothy to be strong or to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And when you're involved in ministry, it's important to be strong, but the strength does not come from within us. We're not strong in our own ability, but we're strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on in these verses and he gives Timothy the recipe for guarding the good deposit. You guard the good deposit not by hiding it away, the good, good deposit of the gospel, but you guard the good deposit by training, by equipping faithful men who are able to teach others. And as often as, often as highlighted, commenting on these verses, you have these four generations what Timothy has heard from Paul, he must teach to faithful men who are then able to teach others. And uh, one area in which we are involved in in Rome is the area of training leaders. And in a sense, we're involved in training leaders both at a local level for our own local church, but then also at a national level for various churches across Italy. And uh, I would like to begin by telling you about one aspect which has been particularly discouraging over the last year, which really relates to our own local church context, and especially to trying to identify faithful men who will be able to lead the church today and tomorrow. Uh, over the past few years, uh, myself and the other elder, we have been intentional in investing in the, life, in the lives of a few young men. We spent some time with them. We've studied and read scripture together. 
we've also involved them, involved them in some aspects of pastoral ministry. And uh, one of these brothers is called Frederick, that you see here in the picture. And he's very gifted. He's a good Bible teacher. He has a real heart for people. And so uh, five years ago, we started meeting with Frederick. Uh, we got him involved in following a few young men in the church. He started to be involved in the preaching in the church. And we were really encouraged by all the progress that we saw in Frederick. And then two years ago, uh, his employer decided to send them away from Rome up to the city of Turin. And so we had invested three years in Frederick and then because of work some circumstances, he had to move from Rome to Turin. Of course, he's not lost for the kingdom of God. He's involved in a local church up there in Turin. But as you can imagine for us as church elders who had spent time investing in Frederick, then it was hard to see him go. Then we started working with Lorenzo. Now, you may be surprised by Lorenzo's fashion style in this orange suit, but uh, remember that uh, Italy is always at the forefront of the fashion, so you'll probably be wearing this orange suit in a few years. Um, but uh, Lorenzo, he actually studied at eBay. He did a three-year course at eBay, and then he uh, studied medicine. He's a, he's a doctor and he got married to Bianca about a year and a half ago. And again, they were involved in our church. Um, and we were encouraged to have Lorenzo and Bianca, this young couple. And in Lorenzo, we could see some potential for leadership. Uh, but then uh, Lorenzo took me out for lunch on, in August. It's never good when someone takes you out for lunch. He took me out for lunch and he shared that as a family, they're relocating away from Rome, and they're relocating to Fondi, which is in a, uh, about an hour and a half away from Rome, and therefore they're leaving the church. Then there was another young man, I won't mention his, his name, and sadly the story is, is much sadder, because it's a young man who has had the opportunity to train, he's had the opportunity to serve, but over the last couple of months he has had a real crisis of faith, and uh, he has abandoned the biblical faith. And again, it was a young man. We could see so much potential in him for leadership, for leading the church, and he has left the church. And so even if I just track the last five years, we have been intentional in trying to invest in the life of some of the young men, so to see them involved in church leadership. And uh, we're glad that Frederick and Lorenzo, they're serv serving the Lord elsewhere. They will be useful to other churches. But for us, it's a bit discouraging because now we need to start again, uh, identifying other young people to uh, invest in. And I would say that this experience is quite a common experience in Italy. It's difficult to identify faithful young men who are willing to serve the Lord and to serve the church. So this has been something which has been something of a discouragement for us over the last year. And we would ask you to pray for our local church that the Lord would raise leaders who are able to continue the work. Are you ready for some encouragement? <laughs> I am. One aspect which has been encouraging over the last number of years has been a yearly meeting or conference or weekend long training for preachers in Italy. I have become increasingly, increasingly convinced of the need to raise the quality and the level of biblical preaching in Italy. Uh, when you raise the level of preaching, you're not just benefiting the preacher, but churches are benefiting from this. And so over the past number of years, I've really been thinking and praying about how to help preachers in Italy to handle God's word well. And four years ago, I was studying, and as part of my studies, I was thinking about the Old Testament prophets. And in particular, I was thinking about how to preach the Old Testament prophets. So I invited a group of 12 friends 
uh, 12 preachers from across Italy, and I invited them to join me for a weekend. And I said to them, I said, during this weekend, I would like to share with you some ideas about how to interpret and how to preach well the Old Testament prophets. Um, I can't guarantee that there will be any benefit for you, any value for you. I just want to test some of my thinking, some of my ideas. And so four years ago, there was the, the group gathered together, and we spent three days uh, working through the Old Testament prophets, especially some of the minor prophets, and thinking how to interpret and how to preach. At the end of those three days together, several of the brothers that attended suggested, why do we not do something similar to this every year? Why do we not consider various books of the Bible or various genres that we find in Scripture? And why do we not consider how to uh, interpret and preach these jo biblical genres well? And so in a very natural way, we decided, okay, to have a yearly uh, appointment, a yearly event, a yearly weekend together where we help one another in interpreting and preaching Scripture. So the following year, as you can tell, it was a COVID year. <laughs> We're standing uh, apart from one another. We met again, and we considered how to preach the parables. And then two years ago, we met, and we considered how to preach the epistles. And then the last year, in August, we met, and we decided how to preach. Uh, we considered how to preach apocalyptic literature in Scripture. And we're still friends, even after spending a weekend considering how to preach Revelation and, and Daniel and, and Zechariah. But as you can see, something which started in a small, small group of men, uh, friends, has expanded. And at the last event, we had over 40 preachers from various churches across Italy coming together, helping one another in the task that the Lord has given us. And of course, the benefit of these time, the time together is not just the formal sessions, but also a lot of the networking, spending time with one another, and also realizing that so many of these brothers are serving the Lord and in a very isolated environment. And so for them to come together for a few days, to enjoy fellowship, to be encouraged and equipped in preaching God's word. Let me just share with you some of the, we asked some of the men who came along to give us feedback. And let me just share with you some of these words that have been uh, very encouraging for me over the last year. So they were describing these weekend intensives. And one brother said, it was extremely encouraging and an enriching experience. This workshop, it's, we call it a preaching workshop, this workshop could be in the future a real game changer, especially in regard to the future leaders of the Italian church. This was a great encouragement for me, old pastor and lone preacher. Opportunities like this are few and far between here in Italy. It is one of the highlights and moments of real encouragement and spiritual refortification during the year. A unique moment of encouragement and growth in my ministry. Never experienced anything like this before in Italy. It has been an amazing opportunity to learn and refocus on preaching, having fellowship with highly experienced brothers and learn from one another. I felt we, as a whole, as a whole Italian body of Christ, grew together as a unity for our needy country. As you can tell, for some of them, English is their second language. <laughs> uh, but ho hopefully this conveys some of the benefit of these uh, preaching weekend intensives. And there is a theoretical part to the weekend where we consider how to interpret scripture. And then there's a practical element where everybody preaches and so you're encouraged by hearing other brothers preach, and then we give some feedback, encouraging feedback. Uh, and the benefit has been that when they go back to their own churches and to their own assemblies, then they continue to take seriously the task of preaching God's word. 
As a result of these uh, weekends, there have been other opportunities to continue to help the church in Italy, and not just in Italy, in taking seriously the responsibility to preach and teach God's word. And so really what has taken place is that some of these brothers, when they returned to their own local church, they shared their experience with other brothers who are involved in preaching and they've encouraged other brothers to continue to be trained and to be equipped in preaching. And so as a result of the uh, preaching workshop, we have now five different preaching courses that are taking place in five different local churches across, across Italy. And so we, we think that we now have over 100 preachers who have been trained or who are trained in the task of proclaiming God's word. I am absolutely convinced of the value of preaching God's word, of not importing our own ideas, of not preaching our own ideas, but of fearfully, fearful exposition of God's word. And I'm convinced that by the preaching of God's word, God creates and builds his church. There is always a connection between the proclamation of God's word and new churches started, the proclamation of God's word and the people of God who grow in godliness. And so this has been really encouraging just to see how in a very, if I'm honest, in a very natural way, the Lord has taken this small initiative and it's been a real blessing and encouragement. So hopefully this will encourage you to, and please pray for new leaders across evangelical churches in Italy and pray for the preaching of God's word in Italy. Thank you. Let's just pray for that work, and then we'll hand over to Ramirez. Father, we give thanks that we can see your hand in things, that you work through us, and we just think of uh, these men who are studying your word, who are meeting together, encouraging each other, and Father, we just pray that you would continue to bless that work, and that individual churches and the country of Italy may benefit as a result of a desire to preach your word and preach it accurately and preach it with power. Pray for those who have moved away. We give thanks for those who are involved in other churches. Take time to pray for this young man who has had a crisis of faith. And Father, we just ask again that you can continue to touch hearts. And we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit there as well. And so for this time just to be in your presence and to encourage each other, we do give thanks in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. It's good to have Ramirez with us. Ramirez has been uh, a good friend of Echoes International over the years. Um, he, I've been trying to get him to Ireland for a few years, but COVID happened. Um, and actually, I, I brought him to Glasgow uh, for a conference a number of years ago, and I was really looking forward to hearing him. But I got a really bad flu, so I never heard him. I never heard his report. So I'm looking forward to hearing it uh, this afternoon. So Ramirez, I'm going to ask you to come up. Um, He's headed up IFES and has also been involved in the Egyptian Bible Society. Uh, he's recently retired. Was that last year? Yeah, retired last year? So-called so retirement. So-called. <laughs> so he'll probably tell you about that as well, but I'll hand over to... You want this over here, yeah? Okay. All right. All right. wonderful to be here at another uh, Echoes event and see familiar faces and to know the warm welcome I receive when I come to Echoes events. So thank you Echoes for your uh, long-term friendship with the Bible site in Egypt and with the, the ministries my wife is involved in and she's speaking about one of them today as well. Actually one that Echoes is not involved in so um, it's exciting. I was born and brought up in Egypt and um, we escaped from the socialist revolution of President Nasser in the early 60s, went as refugees or asylum seekers to Canada when the word asylum wasn't known and they didn't know what to do with us. 
And uh, the first part of it, I was by myself and came to know the Lord through the love of young people at Ebenezer Gospel Chapel in Montreal, Canada. And uh, they reached out to me, a lonely foreign student on his own, and uh, I responded. I came from a nominally Christian background, and um, it was a big, big change. And from the time I came to know the Lord in 1962, I decided I should go back and share the gospel with my people in Egypt, and it took a very long time to get there. Today I'm going to share with you very briefly about the church in Egypt and something of the work of the Bible site. Yeah, I'm very grateful that Andy shared about uh, failure as well as success or disappointment as well as success. I'll be sharing success now, but it's based on 10 times more disappointment. <laughs> and in 31 years as the general secretary of a Bible site in Egypt, I had the unfortunate, painful task of firing at least 25 people, nearly all believers, some of them leaders in their churches, and very painful uh, situations. If I took time to tell you about them, I'd take two hours and you would be very depressed. But I've learned that we're all frail people, that human beings can make mistakes, and with many of those now, we've restored friendship. Uh, one whom I fired when he got married named his son Ramez. So I figured, <laughs> because what we tried to do is not make enmity of people, but explain to them they were no longer able to work. But it wasn't a personal thing. It wasn't kicking someone away. Anyway, that's not the topic, but thank you, Andy, because anything I share here, there will be 10 stories of things that didn't work out. Egypt is known for its tombs and temples. I don't need to tell you that. Um, that's what people come to see. That's what tourists like. That's what helps the Egyptian economy. You may not have seen this 5,000-year-old sunboat because the tomb was supposed to preserve, the pyramid was to preserve the pharaoh's body and his possessions until his resurrection. They even put some, enough food uh, in there. So when he is resurrected, he eat. this ship, this boat, was meant to take the, the pharaoh on the river of life to eternity. And the oarsmen there were killed and buried with him so that when he was resurrected, they also were resurrected to uh, take him there. He wouldn't be able to do the job himself. Very elaborate religion, but a religion that really was all built on investing in eternity. Now, you probably haven't noticed this, that they built their tombs and temples with stones which have lasted 5,000, 6,000 years. Ramses II was one of the longest, well, other than Queen Elizabeth, uh, lasting uh, rulers in the world. And he conquered many countries. He was a very powerful man, but you never see his castle when you go to Egypt. Because though they built their tombs and temples to prepare them for eternity in stone that lasted, they built their homes and palaces in mud bricks because they knew that these would not have eternal value. I think it's a powerful lesson to us what we're investing in and what we're building. And I believe that because of thousands of years of Egyptians seeking and yearning for eternity, uh, a yearning for eternal life is engraved in the genetic makeup of Egyptians. That uh, cannot be verified. My son is a geneticist. He probably disagree. But uh, I really believe that Egyptians are basically religious and basically seeking God. And it's a blessing to live in a country where Christians and Muslims, regardless of how close they are to the Lord, want to please the maker of the universe. And therefore, we don't have wanton crime. Never will someone go and shoot people in a schoolroom, murder people uh, unintentionally. We have fights that people can be killed unintentionally. There's violence, there's crazy people. But there's, they, 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 are, they believe that someday, nearly all Egyptians believe someday they will stand before their maker. And it's wonderful to live in that context. You don't have too many of these people around you in the West anymore, which is unfortunate. The dawn of the, of the Christian era in Egypt began with John Mark. He came to Egypt in, an, in probably year 45 to evangelize the, the main center of Egyptian leadership at that time, which was Alexandria. And as a young man, he didn't know how to handle the situation. How are you going to evangelize this big city of Alexandria? He wasn't a scholar. He wasn't a, 
a philosopher, what's he going to say? What's the message? And he walked up and down the streets of Alexandria, quite discouraged, until his sandal broke. And he went to a cobbler, and as the cobbler was sewing the leather sandal, the needle went into the cobbler's uh, finger, and he yelled up a curse word of God, like, oh my God, or something like this. And that was the opportunity for John Mark, who was well-trained in contextual evangelism, to talk to him about the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that man, Agnes, became the first Christian in Egypt. And after um, Mark came for another visit and was martyred, the church was built. The first church was in Agnes' home. It spread like topsy all over Egypt, so that by the third century, Egypt had become a Christian nation. And I believe it is because the Pharaoh said eternity was the most important thing, but they preserved it for a certain class of people. You had to be rich to, it, to have eternal life. And John Mark came and said, whosoever will may come. Jesus welcomes the rich and the poor, and the gates of heaven are open. So people rushed in, and they became a Christian nation, and I can tell you more about that if I had time, but I won't. But one of the most important things is by the third century, they had translated portions of the Bible in the five dialects of Egypt, so that Egyptians had their Bible in their heart language. Now, one of the reasons when Islam came, the, the Christianity was just about wiped out in North Africa, is because the leaders of the church in North Africa insisted that the newly converted North Africans would worship God in Latin. The scriptures were only available in Latin in North Africa, which was not their heart language. And so when the Arabs came, it sort of, they were challenging something that was not deeply rooted in North Africa, but in Egypt. They used the Pharaonic language, which was the Arabic, they used the different dialects of it, and for them, their faith was part of their culture. So it made a big difference, and that's how Christians survived the Muslim invasion, and um, uh, continue. I'm, I guess I've skipped one slide, which is, oops, oops, oh, anyway. The beginning of evangelical missions in the 1800s, the Anglicans came to evangelize Muslims. So I was born and brought up an Anglican. I am the first of my family whom the Anglicans allowed to be baptized because they would not baptize an Egyptian Christian. They only baptized Muslims. They said, we'll leave the churches in Egypt to take care of the Christians and we'll reach out to Muslims. But after many years, 100 years, they had to reluctantly say, you know, this dream hasn't been fulfilled the way we want. The Presbyterians came to revive the Coptic church, and again, they failed in doing that and had to start evangelical churches in Egypt. The Brethren came following the Presbyterians, and straight away, they were there to establish assemblies of believers. So different strategies as the missionaries came. And I think when a missionary comes with an agenda, um, which is good and has a plan, they try to follow it through, but after generations, these plans have to sometimes be changed. Here's an example of one man, Athanasius of Asyut. He was one of the first um, evangelicals in Egypt. He was, a story of his conversion is too long to explain, but he was a Coptic leader in the Coptic church, and um, he was a committed Christian in the sense that he defended Christianity against the Muslims. He, well, he was well taught. And when he was um, um, known to have the missionaries John Hogg, who was a Scottish min missionary, start a Bible study in his home. Um, he was excommunicated from the Coptic Church, he and his family. It was a, at that time, you could only be baptized, um, um, uh, married, and buried um, in the Coptic Church. So it was disastrous to not, you were really not a Christian in official way. A great, great price he paid. Um, he, when he retired from his work, which I'll tell you about in a minute, he became the evangelist with Dr. Harper, who set up a mission hospital in Cairo. And he spent 16 years of his life evangelizing patients before they went into surgery. Now, why was he such a gifted evangelist? His job was building water wheels. And water wheels are very complicated contraptions. You see them here. They were the only way to water the fields when the Nile wasn't flooding. They would pick up water from the Nile and put it down the fields to water it. It took him about three months to build one of these contraptions. Very complicated. During that time, during coffee breaks, downtime, he would evangelize the people in that village. So historians say he nearly planted a church for every water wheel 
in Upper Egypt. Many around Asyut, which is the town he comes from, many of the villages, churches there, and now the cities, were planted by Athanasius um, while he uh, built water wheels, a creative way of doing evangelism. Anyway, the greatest change that happened in the Coptic Orthodox Church happened in the end of um, the, the 19th century um, when a man, a layman, began noticing that they were losing a lot of their children to evangelical Sunday schools. The different missions that had come and churches had been planted had Sunday schools and that attracted the children. And so the children were going to Sunday schools and the Coptic church had no Sunday schools. They didn't welcome children in church at the time. He was strongly attacked, but he persevered. And um, the, the, it was said of him by the leaders of the Orthodox church, it was dark in the land of Egypt. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light and the light was Habib Girgis. And God saw that the light was good. This is his biography written by one of you. Now, what do you do in Sunday school? You teach people the Bible. The first thing he did, he came to the Bible Society and bought lots of Bibles. Then he had to find people to teach, of course, educated people. The clergy in those days memorized the, the liturgy. They were not educated. So he went and decided to recruit the smartest professionals, lawyers, doctors, dentists, nurses, and these were the people, he said, here are 50 boys, here's a Bible, teach them a Bible so they don't go to the Protestants. And you tell a woman, here are 50 girls, here's a Bible, teach it. Well, these very intelligent professionals had never opened a Bible in their life. So they, opened, they didn't know where to start. They were completely biblically illiterate. They knew the stories, but they didn't know how it fit. So about the middle of the 20th century, they realized they had to do something radical, and one man translated the Protestant classics of the 18th century, F.B. Meyer, Matthew Henry, into Arabic, published them by an Orthodox publisher. There were no copyrights on these books. And they became the textbooks of the tens of thousands of Sunday school teachers all across the nation. So they had the Bible, and they had Matthew Henry or F.B. Meyer to help them prepare it. And that's how these Coptic Orthodox lay people began teaching Sunday school. And of course, when you teach Sunday school, if you teach a memory verse, what do you have to do? You have to memorize it. So the adults became biblically literate. If you ask questions, you have to know how to answer. So, the, so you, they may say, well, next week I'll get you the answer. So all week, he's trying to find an answer. The men of that generation noticed when they went to church, they got very uh, sort of sermonettes, a few nice things, be good, serve God, don't steal. And they said, we are teaching our Sunday school kids giving them more meat than our priests give us on Sunday. So what happened? The men of that generation, hundreds of them, left their professions, lawyers, doctors, engineers, and went into to become Coptic clergy. And that raised the level. So one of the reasons the Bible Society of Egypt has expanded so much in the last little while is for the, what I call the insatiable hunger for God's word that's found in the Coptic church. The, Patriarch of the, the last patriarch of the church for 40 years had a Bible study with 8,000 people. All he did was expound the Bible, like Andy was saying. And he would take questions, and he would answer the questions by quoting the verse and the reference with his Bible closed beside him. Any question he could answer and give Bible verses for it and have the Bible closed. I said, I used to call him the Pope of the Bible. I think he knew the Bible better than any uh, evangelical leader. He really knew it. And he loved teaching the Bible. So the church was changed because of Habib Girgis and, and these many men who became the leaders of the church who knew and loved the Bible. Many of them have opened the door to us and helped the Bible society. And when I asked them, why are you so encouraged? Why are you encouraging us so much? They said, because I was a Sunday school student. I became a Sunday school teacher. And I love the Bible. Anyway, Egypt today, we have uh, 15 million Christians, we think, between 15 percent, 100 million people. Um, it's the largest Arab Muslim country. There are other Muslim countries that are not Arab, that are larger. But half of all the Christians in the Middle East, at least the nominal Christians, live in Egypt. So it's a significant presence. And because the Coptic Church is such a conservative church, it's such a committed church, the Bible is an open book in the church, uh, it's a different kind of Christianity. In many of the places in the Levant, Lebanon, Jordan, um, uh, Palestine, 
you don't see the teaching of the Old Testament because of the whole Israel issue. They're really embarrassed to how to deal with Israel. In Egypt, they were brought up on the Bible stories and they allegorize them. That's why they love the Brethren Publishing House, which produces a lot of books that fit their thinking. And I believe that evangelical publishers, including the Brethren Publishing House in Egypt, has influenced the mindset of these Coptic Orthodox leaders. The churches today, all of them, uh, respect and t believe and teach and promote the Bible, which is very, very encouraging. We also live in a situation where the government, the present leadership with President Sisi has been very committed to supporting Christians in an unbelievable way. Every satellite city that's being built, we, we have a tremendous building boom in Egypt. Uh, the president was recently being shown a plan of a, of a village, it was of a city, I mean, it was on TV. He was discussing it, very excited. And he looked, he looked, he said, where's the church? And the planner said, said, sorry, sir, we did not plan for a church. He really took him to the cleaners. He said, you come next week and you don't do just one church, you do at least three churches, Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic, in that city, and I want it there. And every year he goes to the Coptic Cathedral and addresses the nation during the Christmas service. They know he's coming, of course. So he says, it is a privilege and an honor for me to address the nation from this house of God. Now, for a Muslim to say that, to stand in the church and celebrate Christmas with the Christians, it'd be hard for him to come at Easter because they don't believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But they do believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. So he can very warmly, as a Muslim, say, I celebrate this with you. A new age. In all my years in Egypt, I've never found a more sympathetic government. It doesn't mean everybody's for Christians, there is persecution and so on, but it's not from the top. So that's just for you. When you hear about persecution and then you hear me speak, you think there are contradictions. You know, um, I'll give you one quick example, watching my time here. Um, the president one day read in the newspaper that we, um, there were, that after, uh, within five years, Every 40% of married couples divorced. And so he began thinking of it, and he said, this is because a Muslim can wake up in the morning, upset at his wife, and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. He said it three times, and legally, he will be divorced. They'll be divorced. So the president said, that's crazy. It's, it's a stupid idea. He said, I'm asking the religious leaders to, change, to, to say that that's not so, and I'm asking the, the legal people, the judiciary, to make laws uh, against that, and that you uh, insist that any couple who wants to be uh, divorced should have counseling. Next day, headlines. Sorry, Mr. President, this is part and parcel of Islam and cannot be changed. So you got a slap in the face from the religious establishment. So we have a president who wants to change things, but a conservative establishment that has it hard to do. What's uh, happening today? We have about 400, these are very rough figures, 400 Presbyterian churches, 260 brethren, mostly closed brethren, only 20 open assemblies, but the closed have become very much like what the open were 50 years ago. So apart from communion, you wouldn't make any difference. And the, the most, let's say, the most evangelistic and outgoing churches in Egypt now are the closed brethren. They're increasing and doing wonderful work. Pentecostal, about 150, Methodist, 100. So 1,500 Protestant churches and probably five or 6,000 Coptic Orthodox churches in the nation. Anyway, we were challenged when I began in the 60s to present the Bible in a suitable format, appropriate price, but within the legal and religious and political restrictions in Egypt. So that was a problem. And uh, so our philosophy was, and someone quoted me, this to me, I've said it many times, when a door is closed, see if there's a window, you can jump through. We looked at difficulties as opportunities. So what's the opportunity in this difficulty? And uh, we were restricted from giving out free scriptures to Muslims. I spoke to the authorities. They said, don't give out a Bible to a Muslim free of charge. This will mean you're evangelizing. So we thought of a very ingenious way to distribute Bibles. You wouldn't have ever thought of it. <laughs> so we sell them very cheaply. And as long as the person pays the few pence it is for a New Testament, we're not evangelizing them. 
So I can tell you more about it. So we have all these book tables, um, uh, different places. We, we set up things and our gas stations. We put a Bible society, a little booth on a, at a gas station on the way to Alexandria. And anywhere people do anything for sale, we're there selling the scriptures. We can only sell from Christian outlets, so we multiply outlets all over the country. We now have 19 very modern, attractive Bible bookshops on the street in Egypt. So anybody walking on the street doesn't have to go to the back of a church to see the little bookshop in the back. He can walk on the main street in Cairo, in Asyut, in many of these big cities. And many people have said this has made a tremendous difference in accessibility. Um, so here are some of the bookshops. We have, these are old pictures, I, and this is where they are in, in the country. We're not allowed to proselytize, but there is no law against advertising. <laughs> so in the early, in the early 90, in 1990s and the 2000s, we used every single means of advertising that the commercial people used, including home delivery of scripture, billboards, ads in newspapers, so on. It's become now prohibitive. An ad is, uh, a billboard now on a highway is maybe something like 20, 20 to 30,000 sterling per month. We can't afford that. But in those days, it was something more like 3,000 per year. So we did that. Now we use media. Now we're working very hard on media, and I don't have time. I want to close with a feel for what has happened with, over the years in our children's ministry and youth ministry in getting young Christians in the Coptic Orthodox Church to be excited about the Lord. Now, this is a young girl. She's 16. She's never been to an evangelical church. She's just in the Coptic Orthodox Church, and we do these big events. We call them In His Image, where we ask kids to present. We tell churches, make a competition in your church for Christian talents on a theme, a certain theme, and they come and perform this. They may sing. They may draw. So this girl came up with a unique thing. Uh, she got up. 16-year-old in front of 2,000 people. You don't see the 2,000 people. They're in a big tent we set up. And it's planned by the Orthodox Church, and we are the people who put it on. So just listen to her. It gives you a feel of what God is doing with young people. And I said, young footsteps were following.
You know, we uh, reach out to about 500,000 children like this every year. And when people say you should be directly reaching the majority, I say this is salt and light. A girl like this in the classroom, she's one-tenth of the classroom, let's say. And the others are not from her persuasion. Won't she overflow if she loves Jesus? So as we try through the scriptures to revive people biblically, um, we can see this kind of result. So pray for Egypt and pray that the gospel will go out through young people like her who are being touched by these events and who have leaders like this priest who believes in encouraging his people to know the Lord. She spoke, if you didn't know, she spoke like an evangelical. But she's never been to an evangelical church. She's never contacted. She's been taught this in her Sunday school. She's been taught this in her church as a result of the people I talked to you about. A real change has taken place in, in the last little while. And uh, Egypt is an exciting place to be in. Thank you. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's just close this session in prayer. Father, we give thanks for what we've just heard this afternoon. We think of the challenge of Italy. We give thanks for a country that is close to your word through the church. But Father, we think of the need of the gospel. And again, we pray that the gospel may break through and change many lives. We think of many cities and towns in Italy where there is no witness. And then we turn to Egypt, and Father, we think of a country where Islam is so strong, and yet we think of the gospel that's breaking through. We think of many places where the word of God is seen and heard and read and is changing lives. And again, we just take time to give thanks. We trust in a God whose ways are not our ways and our thoughts are not our thoughts. And again, we just give thanks for the progress of the gospel and the change that's being seen in the many churches and the ability for them to just share the gospel with those around them. And so again, for this time for the encouragement, we do give thanks. We pray for the ladies' session as well. We just ask again, they might be encouraged also. And also for the conference later on, we ask for your help. In the Saviour's precious name, amen. Right, we're going to have a break and we'll meet back at 20 past. If you can come back sharp, that would be good so we can make a start to the next session of the conference. Thank you. Hello from Gospel School for the Deaf. In Fiji. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in everything you do. and he will give you success.
Hello, my name is Richard Hartnett and I work as the ECHOES International Equipping and Training Manager. I'd just like to tell you about Tilsley College, a ministry of GLOW Europe. The college has been involved in training people for Christian ministry for a number of years and my wife and I both studied there before serving in Peru. The one-year certificate program combines classroom learning with practical experience in various areas, including cross-cultural ministry. It's a great way to deepen your understanding, develop your skills, and see what God might be calling you to. Echoes International has partnered with Glow and Tilsley College to support several students each year. So if you have an interest in cross-cultural mission, the support of your local church, and feel that a year at Tilsley would help you to explore this, then we'd be keen to talk with you about that. Also, if you are a church leader and feel that one of your members would benefit from the Tilsley Certificate Year as preparation for cross-cultural ministry, whether in the UK or overseas, then please contact us. The time that my wife and I spent at Tilsley certainly gave us a good foundation for the subsequent years we spent in Peru. And if you feel this experience would be a good next step for you or for someone that you know in your church, then please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Auziți sirenile de culcare. De culcare. Dear friends, greetings from Kiev. Today is 17th of May and we are packing our minibuses to take a long trip to East Ukraine, Donetsk, Lugansk provinces, Slavyansk city, Kramatorsk. Here our friends, volunteers, pastors, which will travel together far away from Kiev. Three days, three. Thank you, all of you, to all of you who has been helping us to have all this really important provision, which we will bring with us to front line. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your love, your help, your support. Greetings from all of us. God bless you. Dear Petr Hus, here is Fyodor, you know maybe him, but you don't know me, you know, our brothers, volunteers, pastors, and we reached destination. This is all help from you, from your brothers and sisters in Czech Republic and Czech Republic and Slovakia. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. So we are in Slavyansk in East Ukraine and delivering all provision here. To brothers and sisters in the seven buses, four buses came here. So thank you, friends, for your love, your prayer.
Let's just take a moment to commit this final session of our conference to the Lord. Lord, we give thanks for the words of that amazing uh, hymn, reminding us of the incarnation, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and our present victory and future hope that we have in him. We thank you that there is no fear in, no guilt in life and no fear in death for the believer. We thank you for all that we've heard so far. And as we come to this final session, we pray for those who will be participating. We thank you for another opportunity to reflect in this part uh, on footsteps worth following. And we do pray in a moment that you would bless David as he comes just to share in that. And then as we hear our final closing challenge, from Rames, we do ask that your hand would be upon him as well. So we commit ourselves to you in these moments in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We had hoped to have Vladimir Chesminsky from uh, Montenegro with us, but he was unable to get a visa to come. But he's produced a six minute video on the work there, and we're going to play that now. <clears throat> Montenegro has a population of about 625,000 people, uh, and there may only be about 300 believers, uh, evangelical Christians in that country. I went there about five years ago, and at that time there were only five evangelical churches, uh, one main assembly in the capital, which had between 55 and 60 people. So it's a very challenging environment, and we look forward now just to hearing uh, something from uh, Vladimir.
Hello, my name is Vladimir Chismanski from Montenegro. I was born and raised in a Christian home in Serbia. And when I was 12 years old, I experienced to be born again. And since then, I felt God's calling to come to Montenegro as missionary. So when I was 23 years old, God miraculously opened the door for me and for another fellow to come together to Montenegro and serve. So where is this small country? Where is it on the globe? Let's see. Now, when we learned where Montenegro is located, here is Montenegrin flag. The nature of this country is really great because on small area you have all kinds of beautiful places. This is Kotor Bay, which is the only fjord on the Adriatic Sea. Here is the largest lake on the Balkan, Lake Skadar. There are rivers with turquoise color. This is River Tara, one of the purest rivers in Europe and with deepest canyon in Europe. Montenegrins are one of the tallest nations in Europe. We came into the land of giants. Main religion in Montenegro is Eastern Orthodox, but there are also Muslims and small number of Catholics. In the whole country, there are just about 300 evangelical believers. Our mission work started in 1992. Two of us came from northern area of Serbia with desire to share the gospel in Montenegro where evangelical church didn't exist at that time. So we started to knock on people's door, offering the tracts with hope that the Lord will open their hearts with interest to know of God's way of salvation. Only one family responded, but it took years to get all of them saved. After four years, God gave me a great helper, Mariana, who became my wife. And soon after we got married, we started to have a small house group. In 2001, we got another helper, Miruška, from Serbia. She came with Child Evangelism Fellowship to work with kids of our friends. In the beginning, it was very small number of kids attending, but after a few years, it grew and we got another couple joining the same ministry to work with more kids. This is our current meeting place. And this was usual number of those who were attending Sunday meetings before pandemic with COVID. During the meetings, we had separate Sunday school for kids of believers. But our kids' ministry started to grow when Samaritan's Purse started to send the shoe boxes. We started to distribute these Christmas boxes in schools. But our highlight was Christmas program when we were organizing to share the gospel with kids and with their parents. Program was designed to keep attention and also to be creative. After these programs, there were more of kids interested to follow our Sunday afternoon programs. We would go to collect them at their homes, bringing them to the church for games, lecture, songs and crafts. Out of that, Child Evangelism Fellowship organized kids camps and it was a unique opportunity for some kids to experience swimming at the sea since some kids were coming from poor families. By the years, as kids were growing, they became teenagers and there was a new challenge for us to organize that kind of ministry. So we started to have regular meetings for them also. The first camp in nature was organized in 2009 at this gorgeous place. We had a morning lecture, a lot of games and fun. There's also evening talks where they could open their hearts. Because there is such a small number of evangelical believers from different denominations, we agreed to have one annual meeting where all believers would have a chance to get to know each other and get encouragement. A few years ago, we were able to buy a piece of land in capital city of Podgorica, where we are planning to build a first purposefully building for the evangelical church, which would be first in the country. There is a great potential to build different ministries that could be facilitated in future building on this land. Even Evangelical Church in Montenegro is really small 
and may be tender as this small flower growing from the crack in the stone, we believe there will be a time to grow and to become a great and strong tree that will be strong enough to break all boundaries that people have toward the gospel and that the life of Jesus will be so visible in us. So please pray for these points with us in order to be recognized in this community as those who love God and people around us. So thank you for your attention and prayers. I hope that you have a better idea where is Montenegro located, but even more important, how to pray for Montenegro, how to pray for these people and um, how to join the strength. And if you have any question, please write us and connect with us so we can share the information and uh, uh, updates that are so important and may God bless you and keep you safe in this crazy time. All glory to him. So this is Europe today. Montenegro, very few Christians. Kosovo, very few Christians, Muslim country. Slovenia, very few Christians. Let's pray for Montenegro. Lord, as we have watched this video, we understand the virgin nature of this work. We thank you for the transition of some of these teenagers from children's work into teens' work, and now some in uh, church fellowship. And so we do pray for the growth of the assembly there in Podgorica, and we pray for Vladimir, his wife, and those others who are seeking to witness in that city. So we commit them to you today and give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. It was great earlier to uh, hear of the work uh, in the past of T.E. Wilson, and thank you, David, again for putting together that presentation. And the theme, Footsteps Worth Following, is a wonderful theme as we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. I'm now going to invite uh, David McAdam to come and just um, give a summary of the work of Betty McGuinness and uh, at Deepa Lata. And after that, we will pray uh, for David and Lorraine uh, who return uh, to Zambia on Thursday. And of course, remember Betty too, as she transitions back into life here in the UK. So thank you, David. The brethren here are not very kind to me today. 25 minutes this morning to summarize the Tokoloki, and 10 minutes to summarize 46 years. <laughs> um, let us uh, read from uh, Lamentations, uh, first of all. Let's, uh, yeah, let's start there at the top. First Thessalonians 1 verse 3. First Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Paul says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. A labor of love. And uh, Lamentations, we, we know it so well. 3 and 23, great is thy faithfulness. And I think those two things would sum up Betty's life um, in so much in many ways. I was spoken, speaking to her this week, and she said, you know, uh, I love Di Balada. I love Di Balada. And uh, it's a <clears throat> tremendous thing, you know, we people who work in the mission field, we love our work. Maybe I didn't <coughs> make that clear this morning, but we really do love our work, and we love the people. And Betty has, has a great love for Di Balada, and that love will, even though she's at home now, that love will always remain. 
And great is thy faithfulness. We're looking back over 46 years here, ever since she uh, left for Africa in 19 and 20, what was it, 1976, and just came home uh, there in June. And that's a wonderful record, 46 years <coughs> of service for the Lord in quite a, in a very remote area. And I don't know, some of you here have obviously been to the Balada, but that's it. Uh, where is this work? Yeah. Where am I? Don't see it. But anyway, you see it in the center there, just in the middle. <laughs> Little group of buildings in the middle of a jungle, really, or certainly bush. So that's where Betty has been for all these years. There she is. It's difficult to get a photograph of Betty, but uh, I've managed to get that one. Uh, you find that with most missionaries, actually. They're, they're very difficult to get photographs of. And uh, uh, what do you think of these characters? <laughs> it's a, um, some, uh, any offers for who that is? That's Mr. Geddes. He's I, uh, I'm away from the microphone. Mr. Geddes, who started to work at Dibalada when he came, I think, from Angola. Uh, what about this man? Jack Finnegan, very good. That's his brother, Jack Finnegan. Um, more difficult, that one. That's uh, David Mawinney, Bob Neal. <laughs> Anybody for out right on the left there? Bill Holiday, yeah, Bill Holiday, very good. So those were some of the men that were involved in the setting up of the work at, uh, at Deep Alata in 1948. So we're looking at a long history here, and uh, this goes for all of us. When we go to the mission field now, we're just building on a foundation that other great men of God have laid in the, in the past. That was the first hall at Deep Alata. It's a bit primitive. <coughs> but still a nice building. We think that's the first hall anyhow. That's it today. So there's a nice assembly there at Deep Alata. Uh, the fruit of work uh, over uh, many years by a number of uh, men and women of God. And that's the little assembly, or little uh, um, a hospital building. As I say, hospitals, the assembly came first and then once that was built in, there was the interest in the medical work. And you can't really avoid medical work in Africa. It's one of those things. Uh, I don't know what to say about Betty. She probably doesn't want me to say very much about herself. But uh, talking to her in recent times, if there's any young person and uh, you're interested in serving the Lord overseas, uh, I would strongly encourage you to go and talk to Betty about how uh, God, <coughs> God called her. It's a remarkable story. And, you know, <coughs> you don't want to... We, it's nice to talk about going out to the mission field, but you don't really want to go out there unless you're absolutely certain that God has called you to that work and that you have the backing of your, your own assembly. Because very often uh, there's many difficulties and it's a very difficult life at times. Uh, Betty was, um, she was saved uh, at 21 due to, through the preaching at the meetings of her brother Jim Martin up there near, just outside Bond Bridge. And uh, she would, was friendly with a number of young sisters in Belfast and one of them happened to be her sister Ann Palmer who went out then to serve the Lord at, uh, at Deep Alata. And But uh, Betty initially worked as a telephonist. And then, like many other young people, and maybe many, some here today, and myself included, I think uh, I think I, I told you this morning that it was only in my late teenage years I started to ask God what he wanted me to do with my life. And Betty was doing the same thing. and. She got advice from a number of people. I think one she said was her brother Sam Kern and how, how to know the will of God for our lives. And he said, well, the most important thing is to 
uh, be with the word of God to take guidance from, from the scriptures. And then God would guide you through circumstances and God would guide you through the advice of others. And all very sound uh, advice. If, you're, if we do things against those things, then we, we only end up getting into trouble. And uh, another brother, I think, she's, I'm just putting this together. Betty could correct me. Uh, but she'll tell you the full stories if you go, to, go and talk to her. Another brother who advised her was her brother, Ronnie Kearns. Uh, in Japan, and he said, you know, a lot of countries now, it's getting difficult to get into just as going as a missionary. You, you need a special qualification, so it'd be good to do a job that you could get a visa easier to enter the country. And that's still very good advice today. Uh, countries are very sophisticated now, and Zambia is, is no exception. And they expect people to have qualifications to come and help in, in the country. Um, so one, thing she, one place she didn't want to go, strangely enough, was Africa. And I'm sure some of you have heard that this little uh, chorus about, don't send me to Africa. And I think many people feel like, you know, there's a lot of bugs and snakes and things like that that don't, aren't very really nice. But anyhow, Betty did, she did nursing uh, and midwifery with a thinking that that will be would be a good start. So she started going, or started, she went to uh, a hospital in England called Sorrento, and there she did a year's general nursing, and then she did uh, a year and a half of, uh, of midwifery. So Betty became a very skilled uh, person in that. She still wasn't sure about where to go, and I, I just can't give you the exact details, but she looked to the Lord for three different times that she would be asked to go to Deep Alata. <laughs> so she wasn't rushing at it. And uh, that's good advice too. God doesn't do things usually in a hurry. And uh, she, eventually she got a third uh, call from God to serve, about service at Deep Alata. And uh, so then the next step was well, also Jim, strangely enough, Jim Martin was involved a bit in that call as well, because Betty was working in, in, in near Birmingham, no, Northampton, and Jim went over there to take some meetings, and Betty, Betty was asked to show him around the city. And the, uh, she was discussing these things with, uh, with Jim, uh, and Jim said to her, Betty, I think you, you will one day go much further that, uh, that Northern Ireland. So he, uh, that was his feeling that Betty was going to the, uh, the, she felt that was also pointing her in that direction. So then she got those three calls confirmed and the, so then she approached the elders at uh, Banbridge uh, about uh, commending her to the work and uh, at Tipalata. And <clears> their <throat> response was, Betty, we are not at all surprised. And they willingly commended her uh, to the work at Deep Alana. And you know, <coughs> that's another, I think, wonderful thing, that if God calls us to a place, it, it should really come as no surprise to our local church fellowship. That, and they can be happily commend you. And you go out with the full assurance and confidence of the backing of her, of her brothers and sisters. Uh, she got there in 1976, as I say, to join her sister and Palmer already there. And uh, well, what a wonderful record of, uh, of service this has, this has been. 46 years, uh, much of it spent in, um, in isolation. It's a very isolated place, place to Ipalata. Uh, Anne Palmer was there for, uh, with her for 20 years, and Mrs. Finnegan, and one or two others at times. But very often, much of it was on her own. Uh, what can I say um, to someone who, or about someone who has done as much as Betty? This is 46 years. I spoke, I remember what I said this morning about medical work being continuous, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
and so on. That's been Betty's life, which is quite a, an amazing thing. And uh, the, sometimes they would have four or 500 deliveries a year. One day she told me she delivered um, 10 babies in one day. And uh, all the time at the, this work was on at the clinic, it's always associated each morning uh, with the preaching of the gospel. So it's a center of care for the people, and it was a center where the gospel uh, went forth. And uh, a number of people came along and uh, over the years. I was gonna say one of the terrible, amazing things that happened early on in her, when she went out, I think it was just after a couple of years, and again, you should talk to her about this, but two, about two years after she went out, they were traveling in a car with Ann Palmer, and the vehicle overturned at, um, in Botswana, and Anne was trapped under the vehicle. And it was just amazing how God had arranged people. The people came off the immigration to push the car off Anne. Betty had to give uh, artificial respiration for a long time, several, several minutes before they got on uh, around again, and then they arranged an evacuation by, uh, by plane, which happened to be there as well. Uh, so when you're in the will of God, it's amazing how God uh, provides. You know, really, you can imagine like trying to resuscitate your, your, your best friend, uh, but God gave Betty the strength to do that. So uh, that was a little hospital that, uh, our brother Tommy Craig and uh, and uh, uh, Wolfie Bickerstaff and others went out and built. Now that is a wonderful testimony still in Lundaland. The people uh, say uh, how wonderful this building is. It's, it's a beautiful clinic. Even the local priest was very impressed with this building. He thought it was a wonderful thing. Uh, that's the, her sisters, that's Betty I think. Uh, and that's Anne and that's uh, Mrs. Finnegan. As far as I know, I've, my information is correct. Now there's an interesting photograph. There's also the, a, we got a, 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 an airstrip at Diva and uh, then when Betty got the, uh, the building, she also incorporated a, th a small theater in it. So for several years now, I've been able to go over, we fly over on a Monday, and we operate all day. And actually, you, you think that uh, we go for the operating. We don't really. We go for Betty's cooking, <laughs> as some people would know. Uh, they, the, Betty does wonderful fish and chips. And the, uh, if I'm looking at a team to go to Deep Alata on a Monday, I have no trouble getting volunteers because they're queuing up to come. Um, but if you look at that photograph, uh, between Betty and Jack there, you have over 100 years of service for the Lord at this little tiny spot in uh, Deep Alana. So it's quite, uh, quite amazing, uh, the God we serve. And uh, we thank God for Betty's work over these uh, uh, 46 years. We are going to miss her. It's a tremendous loss. Betty was always there. I told you this morning, we were from the same assembly in Banbridge. When I was younger, I remember praying for Betty. We went to Congo initially, and, but I never dreamt that in a number of years later, I was going to be working with Betty. And uh, so she is a, Betty is a pretty tough lady, I assure you. Not very big, but she's very strong in all sorts of uh, ways. Uh, now, what's that one? That's, uh, oh yes, that's resuscitating a baby, uh, a, a section baby. She's resuscitated it, and now she's just checking. And then that's Betty, with the, she's very happy now. The baby has been kitted out, and usually in things from Northern Ireland sisters that they send out, and they, they're, they're um, set up. But when you've done all those years, all those deliveries, I mean, you think it would be second nature to you. But Betty can do, I should have said, she can do things that doctors wouldn't attempt here. You know, she's skilled in doing breech deliveries, doing vacuum inspections, dealing with postpartum hemorrhages, you name it, she can do it. 
And the very tough thing about working with Diva Lati is she's 40, about 30 miles from the nearest hospital, and she often has to make a decision. Uh, when will you transfer this patient uh, for further care, maybe need surgery? And th those are very big decisions for a nurse to make in the middle of the night in a very difficult uh, situations. So it's been a wonderful record of service for God and the people of uh, Diva Lata. Uh, this is Brother Joshua, and Joshua, he represents for me also footsteps worth following. Joshua was a brother who came from um, Angola, and he came with Mr. Geddes, and he was one of those people who didn't have any diplomas, but they were taught to do medical care, and he's provided medical care for the people of that area for many, many years. I think he was there when, when Betty first went there. He was a, Betty described him to me as a, a godly, a quiet and godly brother. But he was an elder in the assembly. He would preach the gospel and then he would see the patients. And there's been so many African brethren like that. Nowadays we've got more gift, or we've got more diplomas and things, but. It's, medicine is more to do with the heart than very often the intellect. And these brothers were, did a wonderful service for God. Uh, and that's uh, Brother uh, Joshua. Again, it's support from home. That's the, the, the container arriving with the, uh, the, the parcels. And that's used for making up little parcels for Sunday school. And Betty has spent many, many hours uh, there. And that's her again. And uh, I don't know if you can see this photograph too well, but that's the road ahead. <laughs> Betty's standing there. And you see the two, um, the two uh, young ladies heading forward. And uh, we don't know what the future holds. Any, if they look back, they would see Betty there. Betty's no longer there. Um, but the work goes on. And uh, do I have confidence in the work continuing to deepen that? Well, yes, you know, as our brother mentioned there, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail. Uh, our young sister is there, they could look back and see her. <laughs> they can't do that now, and there's an obstacle there, but they'll just have to learn to get it out of the way and go on with God. So uh, we commit better to your prayers. Uh, and. Uh, it's a big transition. It was a transition going to Africa. It's a huge transition coming back uh, into a different world from 1976. Do pray for her and uh, commit her to the Lord. Uh, remember her in your prayers. But we do thank God for all those years of service. And that's the last photograph. That's uh, Janelle Haikup, who is the midwife who will be taking over, uh, and Mark, her husband. At Deep Alada. do remember them in prayer uh, uh, in this big responsibility. Uh, thank you. I think I've gone a bit over the time here. And now I think we're going to have a presentation. Um, a small, um, as I said this morning, it's, uh, uh, does this well, go down there? All of it, I can down here because I don't think it's breaking up. Will you hear me? Thank you. 
three of them. Let me just pray. Father, we give thanks for a God who is faithful. We think of the work at Ipalata and we think of the work in Zambia and we can look back and give thanks for all that you've done and we pray for Betty. We give thanks for her service and again we just ask that she settles back in Northern Ireland that you would just be with her. Your promise is always to be with her and just bless her as she seeks to serve you here as well. And for David and Lorraine as they would travel back on Thursday, Father we pray for them. We give thanks for their service. We think of the work in Chip as well. And again, as we think of a, a, a land that you've transformed with the gospel, we thought earlier of the, of the president and we pray for him also. But Father, we just pray for David and Lorraine as they would travel back. We give thanks for them. And again, we ask that you bless them on their journey. And so for this time to be with each other and be together, we do give thanks. And we say your precious name. Amen. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> Can I just um, give us our uh, closing uh, short talk? Just say thank you for um, being with us today. We have very much appreciated uh, all who have given time to come and be here. We also uh, want to thank the speakers from Egypt and Zambia, uh, from Montenegro, uh, from Italy. Uh, so thank you for your contribution uh, as well. Thank you to John McFadden, who's been playing for us today, uh, for the technical team who have uh, done all the background work, and thank you too for those who have come uh, to share something of their ministry through the exhibitions uh, as well. It's been lovely to have Ramis here with us. Um, I think probably three or four times I've been with him, and I think he's one of the wisest men that I've ever known. Uh, as you listen to the gems that come from him, um, it is quite astounding just to learn from his experience. He's preached all over the world, and we're privileged just to have him come and share God's word with us. Uh, now. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's been wonderful for Rebecca and I to be with you, and I'm conscious of the fact that the staff have to catch a ferry tonight, and we wouldn't want them to, to have to row back. So I will cut off a few things and speak quickly. Um, Echoes has been sending missionaries for many, many, many years. And I want to focus today on footsteps we're following Abraham, Jesus, and Paul. Abraham was the first missionary. Christ was the perfect missionary, and Paul, for us, the model missionary. Now, Abraham was the first missionary and got the call that every missionary we've heard about tonight gets. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country. And we heard today how people left their countries to go at the great sacrifice from your people, where you identify with, where you're born up, your social network. I tell people who emigrate from Egypt, you're throwing in the garbage your social network, your social capital. You can take some money with you, but you can't take your relationships. And you have to start from zero, very costly. And then your father's household, the family, the close-knit family where you are, to a land that I will show you. He didn't tell him where he was going. He said, leave all this to a land I will show you. Now, of course, he also did something extra for him. He tested him after so many years of promising that through Isaac, he would be blessed. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and in brackets, Isaac, in case you want to go and kill Ishmael, and go to the land of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering mountain, I will show you. Again, he doesn't tell him where the mountain is. He doesn't tell him where the country is. It's faith. It's using a GPS rather than a map, where you put the destination there where you're going and you don't know exactly how you're going to get there. In the first call, Abraham was called upon to give up all his past, all in his past which gave him security and identity. He was stripped 
of everything that meant something to him. All his heritage, all that was behind him, was just taken out. He had no backing. In a second call, he was asked to do the same for his future. All these many years, he had dreamed that through Isaac, he would have a future. Now he's told him, risk that future, just like you risked the past. He was completely discombobulated. He was taken out of the context. And that was why we call him the model of faith. The most remarkable promise I think ever made was through your offspring, all nations on earth would be blessed because you have obeyed me. All nations, and we've talked about all nations today, so in a real sense, if Abraham had disobeyed, maybe we couldn't be hearing all these wonderful reports because it says he had faith which was counted as righteousness. It's his faith that made him who he was, that made him the one who went. So in many ways, Abraham is a model missionary, and we fall short of that model many, many times. Jesus was the perfect missionary. We can't compare ourselves with him. Being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, and there are seven steps of how he went down. He made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus gave up everything dear to him to accomplish his missionary call. He left his country, heaven, where he was protected and safe to become vulnerable. Vulnerable to disease, vulnerable to attack, vulnerable to insult. He left his people, the hosts of heaven, and he left his father's household. But unlike Abraham, God didn't spare his son. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Again, belief, faith. Whoever believes will have eternal life. And as I said earlier to, to the men talking about Egypt, um, the passion, the search for eternal life is still there in many people's hearts. And the gospel is so remarkable, so unbelievable, so simple and yet so deep that we forget how much we have. And we forget the big advantage we have today of trusting the Lord. A good friend of ours died today and Rebecca was very very sad. And I had to write to my grandchildren to comfort them. And I said, Alex and Tasha, we do not mourn for Bibo who died. We mourn for you, his family, his parents who lost him and who are missing. But unlike the world, we do not mourn like those who have no faith. Because we believe that he's in heaven, he's in glory, but we're suffering. And we comfort those who are suffering. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we have to believe this. And so often, I think we take these things so much for granted until we face this situation. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And we heard today about success. We heard about failure. Elizabeth Elliot, one of the statements that's impacted Rebecca and I over our many, many years, her statement, God has not called us to success, but to obedience. And so often in the missionary enterprise, we want missionaries to say success stories. Andy today said how he faces failures or problems. We're not called as missionaries to be successful. We're called to be faithful, to be obedient, and to trust God for the results. And maybe those of you who pray for missionaries, help them to share their, their disappointments, their discouragements, their struggles, without condemnation, without reducing your support, because not as many people are, are responding to their message as those of some other missionary. That's a big challenge in missions that we face. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. He is our model missionary, a perfect missionary. Paul is a model missionary. 
And interestingly enough, he had seven in, in, in Philippians um, chapter two, uh, sorry, chapter two, we see Jesus giving up seven things. In chapter three, we see Paul giving up seven things. Circumcised, he said, if anyone has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, the persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And we can go on. It's a lovely thing. Paul gave up everything dear to him in his past to accomplish God's missionary call. Just like Abraham did. He left his country, he left his people, he left his father's household and went in that risky journey where in 1 Corinthians 11 he lists all the struggles he had. Everything could happen. I never knew he had more than one shipwreck until I read that passage. Incredible what he went through. For Jesus, he never complains. He never says, Lord, you called me, why do I have trouble? He believed that this was part um, Another statement of Elizabeth Elliot, suffering is never for nothing. She has a whole series on that. I'd recommend you listening to if you're going through difficulties. Suffering is never for nothing. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Every missionary should be able to say that. And that is... And then Paul also, like Jesus, said, be imitators of me. When I read that once, I thought he was very presumptuous. Paul, how can you say be imitators of me? Who are you to say that? But then he said that little word as, as I am of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. If I'm not imitating Christ, don't imitate me. But wherever, whatever I do to imitate Christ, then imitate me in it. So Abraham was the first missionary, way before Echoes. Uh, Christ, the perfect missionary, we can't compare ourselves to him, but Paul, our model missionary, and we can compare ourselves with him, and we can be challenged by his life as well. And of course, following the three of them, we have uh, a real sense of what missions is all about. God has not changed his plan. It's not that the modern missionary movement discovered something. It just returned to something God had from history, from beginning, when he called a man called Abraham, and then he sent his son Jesus, and then the Apostle Paul went and evangelized Europe. Now, what are the opportunities for Christian missions today? I'm going to run through them, um, and please don't think in any way I'm exhausting what I say in the next five minutes. The world is at our doorstep, and we can access the world from our living room. We live in a different world. Today you have people of countries that are closed, that missionaries went miles to go and see, cost them a fortune. They're at your doorstep. They're down in your streets. They're in the slums. They're, in, they're the asylum seekers. They're the people who don't have housing. You have them, even here in Ireland, from way deep in Africa and Asia and every place. So I think the first call should be to reach out to people who are there. They're just here. And the other thing, and I'll talk about it later in a minute, is... If you don't feel comfortable with Indians, please don't go to India. If you don't like Chinese, don't go to China. You know, many, many people go overseas and then don't like the, the culture of the people, of the food, of the situation. You know, and now you have a choice of trying it right here before you go to these people. So please do that. The second thing is we can access the world from our living room. So the world is our doorstep, I said that, and we can access. The main means by which people communicate and receive information today is a mobile phone. We put things on the Bible Society, on internet, on uh, websites and everything, and still 80 to 90% of the people who access our material is through their phone, and they say the phone. They say that by 2026, there'll be 7.5 billion mobile phones in the world. So we have access. We can reach people this way. Zoom has 300 million users in meetings every day, of course, probably because of COVID, but it's continuing. So the world, we have new ways to access the world. It doesn't mean we don't need missionaries to go, but it does mean things are changed. So what's the challenge of cross-cultural traditional missions today? We still want to send missionaries. 
I'm delighted as I looked, looked at the booth and saw that this is called um, First Serve, not Short-Term Missions. Calling it short-term missions denigrate the word mission, which we heard today about truth and the price people pay. Going to Haiti for a week to build us a wall for a church is not short-term missions. It's an information trip. It's wonderful. You need it. And then the next step would be this kind of training. You go and stay longer and be trained. And then, if you think of staying long, more long-term, you can be called a missionary. I really believe um, that short-term missions is a contradiction of terms. And we've heard today nearly everybody who spoke about the longevity, the years of investing in people, the years of learning the language, the years of working. Rebecca and I have found we've been 42 years back in Egypt. Now, in 2020, in the past 2020, we're beginning to see some of the fruit of people we invested in in the 80s. Now, if we'd left and gone back to Canada, we wouldn't have had the joy of seeing seeds we planted 40 years ago now sprouting. It's long-term that God wants us to work. And long-term missions, I believe, is the only way to real success. There's a lot of kinds of success, but if we want to invest in people, if we want to see a lasting impact, it's going to take a lifetime, or at least a very long time. Now, I don't want to act sound critical to people who go on a short-term mission assignment. Nothing wrong with that. Do a mission for a short time. But I'm saying we, we should be careful not to forget the concept of missions, both for Abraham and for Jesus and for Paul. It was a lifetime commitment. Now, what's the other challenge? The challenge is the business model, numbers instead of disciples. How many people can my pound bring to the Lord where and how cheaply? So country X, a soul costs two pounds. Country Y, a soul costs 10 pounds. So of course I'll give to country X. That's the way many people think today of missions. Rome, return on mission, is used in mission circles today. Where can my pound get more people for Jesus, that's where I'll put my money. Not where is God calling people to go, and I'll go with fine. And success instead of obedience, I mentioned that already, and projects instead of ministry. We used to think of someone going to India, so we're going to support missionaries to India. Then we said we're going to support missionaries to work for this mission, so we're supporting a mission. Now we switch to projects. It's all projectized. And the big danger in projects is that you can lose the sense of the long term, so that those of us on the field would never know if we're a project that's up for sale or if we're a mission people are committed to. And that's a big danger, I feel, in funding today. Projects are fine. It's, nice to give, it's good to give to projects when there's an earthquake, when there's floods, when there's something short term. But if you're going to go shopping with your shopping cart for a project that feels more comfortable or more interesting, then those of us on the other end of a project feel completely insecure. Because today you might give me a lot of money and next year, no money. So how can I continue the project and so forth? That's a long thing, we could take a long time. In our 42 years in Egypt, Rebecca and I have outlasted most cross-cultural missionaries in the country. And we have been able to see that the main, 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 main characteristic is love. If you love people, you've got a doctor's degree in missions. You don't have to go to a mission society. I mean, the training is good, but as I tell people, you have to be a missionary before you get trained to be a missionary. You have to have a heart of a servant of Jesus Christ who wants to serve Jesus before you go and take degrees in it. And so many people have come with all sorts of training packages. They think they, they really know it because they've gone to this school of missions. They've learned this method. They've learned this tactic, which were imposed. Well, all, they, all, all, all they need to be, really, is loving and caring. And these are the missionaries who make the greatest impact. So loving people who are long-termers, that's what I think we still need, as we've always needed. Um, I'm going to close reading this wonderful verse, which I think 
puts in light of everything we've heard today from different places, the, the, in the price that was paid, the work that was done, the many years of toil and suffering and sickness of many of the missions that you heard about. Now unto him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. He's going to do it, not us. According to his power, not our smarts, not our power, not our money. That is at work within us, to him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations from the time of Abraham forever and ever. Amen. We do want to finish on that theme now to him, and our closing hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. In that first line, there's two great truths, the faithfulness of God and the fatherhood of God. And today, I don't know if you saw it under Angola Beloved, the story of God's faithfulness. And Lamentations 3 and 23, great is thy faithfulness. So let's stand and sing this hymn together and remain standing for a closing prayer. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello from Gospel School for the Deaf. In Fiji. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in everything you do. And He will give you success.